with the uh, February 17th TDC meeting. And uh, first of all, welcome to everybody. Good to have everybody here. Uh, Tony, if you could lead us in the pledge, that'd be awesome. States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Tony. And uh, we'll do a little uh, roll call, go around, introduce ourselves. And instead of saying who you're with, let us know where you were born and the last time you visited there. Start with you, Tony. <laughs> Hit the, hit the uh, mic there. Oh, I get that all the time. <laughs> Tony Satterfield, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and the last time I was there was November of 2019, and it reminded me why I don't live there anymore. <laughs> Julie ward Bajalski. I was born in Washington, D.C., and the last time I was there was 2009. Oh, that's been a while. Doreen Moore, good morning. St. Petersburg, Florida. Wow. And uh, I guess last week. <laughs> <laughs> Frank Hibbard, Chicago, Illinois, uh, two years ago. Yeah. Russ Kimball, uh, Pittsfield, Massachusetts, about uh, two or three years ago. Yeah, great. Good morning, uh, Steve Hayes, uh, Bloomington, Indiana, and I can't remember the last time I was there. <laughs> it's been a while, huh? Uh, Dave Eggers, um, and I was born in St. Charles, Missouri, and I was there when I was 12 years old uh, with my dad watching a Cardinal baseball game. So, it's been a while. Michael. Good morning, Michael Zoss. Um, I was born in Jersey City, New Jersey, to very proud Cuban parents who had emigrated to this country about a year earlier. Uh, and the last time I was there was probably about 2015. Oh, very nice. Uh, good morning, Rick Kreisman, born in Detroit, Michigan. Uh, was last there a year ago, and ah. uh, recognize the only thing I missed was the apple cider and nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> good morning, Trisha Rodriguez, uh, Waukegan, Illinois, which is like 35 minutes from Chicago, and two years ago is when I was there. Very nice. Uh, Phil Henderson, Arlington, California, which is in the Riverside County, which is the L.A. area. I was only there for 12 or 18 months, so I don't remember much about it. <laughs> I was near there at LAX uh, about three years ago, flying to and from Tahiti. <laughs> <laughs> much better place. So flew over, around, or near <laughs> on your way? Well, through LAX. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe I flew over the old house. I don't yeah. know. Good morning, Chuck Prather. Uh, Miami, Florida. Last time I was there, um, during the pandemic, we uh, had trouble getting some supplies for the pier, um, our construction project. So just got in the truck and drove down there. And uh, uh, interesting city. Yeah. I'll leave it at that. Yeah, definitely. And, and for some of you who hadn't been home in a while, I mean, it's significantly different. I, got, I went there when I was, it was, the hospital wasn't even there. It had only been 12 years since I had been born there. So things change so fast. But uh, well, anyway, thank you for sharing this morning um, of that. And really the only comment I was going to make this morning was um, I had an opportunity yesterday to go down to our mid-county site that we've set up on um, for vaccinations, for vaccines down on uh, East Bay. And uh, it was just amazing to see the operation. Um, the folks that are involved, of course, that scheduling is mostly overtime, a lot of Department of Health nurses, um, a lot of firefighting, uh, you know, folks that are paramedics that are part of it. There was at least, I saw at least six fire chiefs that were there helping and volunteering uh, and very busy with what they were doing. So it's a real, real group effort. Um, saw two, two lines reasonably long, not too bad. Um, and uh, folks that I had a chance to talk to in the line were, were extremely happy with the, the system that's in place now, which is very different than it was even a week ago. So um, you actually just register and, and then they call you 
to set up an appointment. So you're only one of 10,000 that might be calling in for an appointment instead of one of 200,000, and the system's not crashing. So we'll see one week, uh, and, it was, and it worked out pretty well, but you know, we'll see if we can do that for two weeks and three weeks. But uh, it, was a really, it was a really good day. I had a chance to visit with some that were waiting after their shots to just hear from them and uh, express the frustrations over the past few weeks, but very, help, very grateful to be there and, uh, and much improved system as well. They had a few ideas, of course. Everybody has some ideas, and, um, but it was overall a really good day, so I just wanted to pass that along. Um, and with that, I don't have anything else to, to, to bring to the table this morning. Uh, just approval of the minutes. Uh, hopefully everybody had a chance to look at them. Um, any changes, or if not, do I have a motion for approval? Was that uh, Rick? Second. Mayor Kreisman uh, made the motion. Mayor Hibbard was the second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Okay. Um, I don't have any notes up here for any public comments. None, none in the room. Okay. We'll move on to tourism industry updates. I'll, I'll turn this over to Steve so that you can do the proper introductions. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Um, I think it was a couple of meetings ago we had uh, members of the uh, TDC had asked about airport updates, and last month we were able to hear from St. Pete Clearwater National Airport. Uh, today we have the folks from Tampa International Airport and who are doing a, a fabulous job, um, like our airport here, but on the other side, um, especially in some of the unique things they're doing for travelers, uh, especially around the pandemic. And uh, the great thing is with Chris and his staff and, and, and really the direction of Joe is how well they keep the industry informed of what's happening. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing even more from uh, Joe and Chris on, on what's going on there. So let me introduce to you the uh, President CEO of Tampa International Airport, Joe Lapano, and then um, who, for the update. Good morning, Joe. Welcome. Good to have you here. Thank you. It's good to be here with you. I uh, haven't presented to this group in a little while, but uh, I see uh, some faces. My old friends are here, and uh, thank you for having me this morning. And whoever uh, arranged for the weather, the cold Arctic air, that was a brilliant move. <laughs> its timing was perfect. My daughter lives in Dallas, and it's snowing and hailing there this morning. has no power. So uh, oh you can God. expect a surge of people who want to be on our beaches. <laughs> Before I start, let me just say that we've been cooperating very closely with, uh, with the tourism administrations here and on the Hillsborough side for ever since we got here. And Steve, you and your group are awesome, and it's great to work. We've never collaborated more closely than we are right now. And maybe, I suppose that's a really good thing. In these tough times, we really have to understand what everybody's going through. So uh, here we go. So 60% of the passengers who fly in to Pinellas arrive at, at Tampa Airport. So we know that we are the gateway. We're very important to you, and you're very important to us as well. And our airport has undergone quite a bit of changes, as you probably noticed. We've redone all 70 of our shops and restaurants, and about 80% of them are back open right now. Uh, our highest traffic month was March, 2.3 million passengers, and our lowest is September at 1.4. We have 22.5 million annual passengers before the pandemic hit, and we have four air sides at the present time with 58 gates. We have 23,000 parking spaces. We handle 492 million pounds of cargo, and we also are in charge of three general aviation airports, Peter O'Knight, Plant City, and Tampa Executive. They are also uh, really gems, actually. So uh, Tampa Bay and Tampa, uh, the region's award-winning beaches are 30 minutes from Tampa. Uh, downtown Tampa is 15 minutes away. We're 3 million MSA population, 1.5 million MSA labor force, and we're the 18th largest metropolitan area in the US. And I can tell you, when we, when we meet with airlines and we take them and sometimes we'll put them up in a helicopter, we'll show them downtown Tampa and take them out to St. Pete, take them out to the beaches, it's, it's everything. It's everything they want. They got all the business they want. They got all the leisure they want. I mean, who wouldn't be here? That's why, that's why all of us are here, right? Uh, economic impact is major, $14.4 billion a year in economic activity. 
It's the 28th busiest airport in the U.S. It's ranked as a large hub airport by the FAA. 121,000 jobs are supported, and 10,500 people come to work every day at the airport. About 600 work for the Aviation Authority, and the remainder work for either TSA, the airlines, the concessionaires, and so on. Our three largest airline market share partners, Southwest Airlines has 30% share, American at 16, and Delta at 16 as well. Uh, Southwest has shown a major commitment to this market, even during COVID. Uh, as you all probably know, they, had, they continued flying and uh, actually increased their schedule continually. We usually have 500 daily flight operations, 90 plus nonstop destinations, and 30 international destinations before the pandemic. Our top 10 markets in domestically, New York, Chicago, Atlanta, Boston. This is no surprise to you all as, as tourism and uh, folks, but uh, New York, Chicago, Atlanta, all East Coast is the top for us. And we continue to get good accolades. Uh, we're very, very proud of the, of the legacy of this airport. These, these are not the result of what I have done. These are the result of those who came before me. And uh, I remember when I took the job, I, I met a woman uh, at a tailgate, and she found out I was going to run the Tampa airport. And she came up and got in my face, and she said, don't you mess up my airport. And I said, yes, ma'am. So I know the pride uh, in the airport that everybody has, and my goal was not to take it to number 10. So, uh, so far, so good. On, in terms of passenger traffic, we were really, really on a roll, as you guys all know. Uh, when I first got here back in uh, 2010, you know, we were lucky to add 100,000 passengers a year. Um, now, we're, before the COVID pandemic, we were adding a million more passengers a year. And then you can see what happened. It was, uh, sh well, shocking is, it, there's no word to describe what that was. Uh, but we're coming back, and I want to show you a little bit on that in, mo in a moment. Here you can see the uh, Tampa and the national passenger trends. So the Tampa trend is in blue, uh, the U.S. departing passenger trend is in yellow. So you can see that we continually outperformed the entire U.S. in terms of recovery. And you can see even uh, the Christmas period there between well, 1 December and, and 1 January, you can see the peak in blue versus the rest of the country. So we have done relatively well. And we're predicted as Florida's most resilient major market. So we track uh, Brookings Institution, says that the top Florida metro areas in order of resilience are number one, Tampa, St. Pete, Clearwater, number two, Lakeland, Winter Haven. And if you look all the way down at the bottom, you see Miami and Orlando. And again, over at Chamora Economics and Analytics says that Lakeland, Winter Haven is number one, and number two is Tampa, St. Pete. Again, ranked number eight is Orlando, Kissimmee, Samford. So we're, relative to others, we're doing very well, and we're project, projected to come back very quickly. Our root network is returning very, very rapidly and nicely. All the red dots are services that we currently have. So some of, the, some of the red dots have fewer flights to them, but they're still served. The white dots are places where we have lost service, but we're working on getting it back. Of course, most of the white dots are in the international arena, as you can see. Uh, new and resuming flights from Tampa, international services resuming. Uh, British Airways has published a schedule where they'll start flying again on 27 March. Cayman, uh, 1 April. Copa started to Panama. Uh, Edelweiss has published a schedule for 30 March. Lufthansa, 28 March. Uh, Silver to Nassau, 11 March. And Southwest to Havana, later in March. And then WestJet to, West to Toronto, 25 April. Uh, some of these are going to shift. These are, these are just published schedules. They change all the time. But they're out there for sale. Newly announced markets, you can see Frontier to Boston starts April 14th. Delta flying to Miami starts June 1. And JetBlue flying to Raleigh-Durham starts February 11th. Actually already started. So let's talk a little bit about the pandemic. So we went down uh, on one day, well, it took about three days for us to drop 96%. And to say shocking, I, I don't know what the word is, and, and you know, I've been doing this sort of work for a while. I've modeled a lot of scenarios. Every time I re report a budget, they say, have you, have you stress tested it? Yes, we've stress tested it. We think if, even if we went down 25%, we, 
we would be okay. And it, no one's ever asked me, have you modeled down 96%? No, I missed that one. But I didn't have to model it. I was walking through the terminal, I was seeing it. And it was quiet. There wasn't anybody out there. And immediately our concessionaires plummeted. Everybody was looking for relief. And thank God we got some relief. But the economics turned very ugly very quickly. No surprise to anyone in this room. So we quickly reacted and said in April um, that we, we, people are going to come back to fly again. We have to be ready. So we created a program called TPA Ready. And what were the elements of that? Well, you can see we installed 275 acrylic barriers. We, we required all of our employees and all of our airlines to wear face masks. That's back in April. Uh, we blocked off seating and gate hold areas so you couldn't sit next to somebody else. We put down 5,500 social distancing signs. We used additional cleaning crews and increased frequency of cleaning. And 180 hand sanitizer stations were installed back in April. And then we got innovative again. And on October 1st, we started the first ever airport COVID-19 passenger testing program. Uh, it was the first in the country. And we offered two types of FDA approved tests both the PCR, which is the most accurate, it takes 24 to 48 hours for results, and the rapid antigen test, which results come back in 15 minutes. It was available to both departing and arriving passengers, and the test site was in the main terminal. So uh, we've now done more than 16,000 tests administered to date, uh, positivity rates below 2%, in case you're curious, uh, and the program has been extended into 2021. So uh, that's in, in partnership with BayCare, and it's really been very widely received well by our passengers who feel like most people say, look, I'm going to visit my relatives. I just want to make sure I'm good. And I can tell them when I get off the plane, I just got the test, I'm good to go. And uh, here you can see where it is. It's right between air sides uh, F and E, and uh, very convenient for our customers. And we got a ton of media coverage. Uh, we were on NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Uh, Wall Street Journal covered it. You can see up there. Uh, it, it was really very well received, and uh, we got great publicity from it. I'll finish up and talk to you about the master plan. You've all seen the work that we've done. We started the master plan about nine years ago with phase one, which was uh, a decongestion phase. We found that there was a lot of congestion on the curbs and on the roadways, mainly driven by the fact that our rental car center was right there at the terminal. And the customers had to cross the street to get to the rental car center, which caused a great deal of congestion. So we moved the rental car center to the south. We connected it with an automated people mover known as SkyConnect. And we expanded the main terminal and redid all of our concessions. So that's phase one. Phase two is underway, and I'm, I'm happy to report it's very close to budget and very close to schedule at this point. Uh, we're, we're doing a Sky Center office building that's connected to the train. So you can imagine if you rent an office there and you have to go to Chicago for dinner, you don't have to move your car. You just take the train up to the plane. Next day, you get back and you go right to your desk. Uh, we're expanding our curbside, so we'll have double the curbside capacity. We're calling the new ones express curbs. So if you already have your boarding pass and you don't have any baggage to check, you don't have to mess with the ticket counters. You go right upstairs and go out to your plane. Um, we're building a new central utility plant, which will be very state-of-the-art, energy efficient. And we're expanding our roadways to four, to four more lanes coming in and going out. The final phase deferred, um, and, and because of COVID, by the way, we deferred $900 million worth of capital projects. One of them was uh, Airside D, which is about a half a billion dollar project. That is a beautiful terminal. It's, it's, if I could show you pictures of it, it's amazing. And I will tell you, uh, we pushed it back four or five years. I think we're going to be sooner than that to build this terminal, because we see great signs of uh, progress with the, with the vaccinations. And uh, we know for a fact that there's so much pent up demand for people after you've been spending a year in your house, and if you get a chance to go just about anywhere, you're going. Uh, so the state of the industry as a, at the moment, you know, COVID-19 cases are still high, but they're going down. Uh, vaccine distribution seems to be uh, to, to the point that you made, Dave, I think earlier. Uh, you know, we finally figured it out, and that's, that's fine. We got it right, and it's moving along very nicely. Uh, we still have travel restrictions and quarantines in certain countries. Uh, those are all going to become resolved once this vaccine becomes available. 
And our opportunities, you know, Tampa Bay is attracting a lot of new residents and visitors. That, that's for sure, uh, especially from uh, places like New York and California. Outdoor attractions and experience, of course, are a big draw. People want to be outdoors. They want to be at the beaches. They, they want to be safe. And we have a great uh, relationship with our tourism community and our economic development partners. And uh, Steve and his team have been with us the whole way in, in our efforts to attract new airlines, new destinations. It's a team effort, and it's not done by any one person. So with that, I will say thank you, and I'd be happy to take any questions if you have any. Chairman. Well, first of all, thank you. That was, it's always great to just get an update on what's going on. I just can't imagine going out into that terminal that next that day or two afterwards and just, uh, you know, yeah. empty. Uh, we've had just amazing stories all year about things that just blow your mind, but that would be a very <laughs> big yeah. change. Yeah. So uh, thank you and God bless you for hanging in there this year and getting us kind of on the road back. Oh, yeah. That's, We're going to uh, come back. That's good. Got some questions uh, for Joe? Anybody? Uh, yeah, Mayor. Joe, you you know I think you're a superstar. We're very <laughs> blessed to have you at TI. And you say that after you've seen my golf game. Uh, uh, so. <laughs> well, we're in the same boat right now. So <laughs> we won't talk golf game. That's depressing. Um, this really isn't under your control, but it's something I just wanted to bring up. Uh, I was traveling about three weeks ago. Um, to the, our countryside area from our downtown. And I drove past a manufacturing plant that has been in Clearwater for a good 20 years. Super building, good company, it's for sale. Uh, they produce seals for airplane engines and they have to turn them around worldwide very quickly. So UPS left Pi and went over to TIA. And now they won't pick up as late as this company needs to. And so they had their building for sale. They're moving 65 jobs to Louisville. Ooh. I don't know what kind of relationship you, know, you have with FedEx and UPS. That is one unintended consequence that I'm not wild about, obviously. And I just wondered if you had any insight on how we might be able to work with them to avoid instances like this going forward. This may be very unique. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I asked if I could intercede, but they've already made the decision and they're, they're moving everything to Louisville because that's where UPS has their major hub. Yeah. Well, um, Mayor, let me just say this. The, we would never um, approach any airline that serves St. Pete Clearwater to try to have them come to Tampa. So they came to us because they weren't able to expand because I think St. Pete Clearwater was expanding their passenger side, which, okay, I understand that. And so uh, from our standpoint, we wanted to keep them in the region. We, we definitely didn't want to move into Lakeland or someplace like that. So um, they have a very limited operation. I think they have two flights a day at TPA. And um, I, I probably can't help in that situation. I'm sorry to hear that that, that, that happened, but... Uh, uh, Sorry about that. No, no, no. I'm not blaming you. I'm just trying to figure out if there's ways we can avoid it in the future. Um, and just the type of communication yeah. and relationship. I mean, I would have called UPS and tried to get later pickups. Uh, I wasn't made aware of it. Okay. I just saw the for sale sign. But it is, I mean, we never think about unintended consequences. That's true. Right? I think it's a unique situation, as you said earlier. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, and is, are there any plans with the hotel? Yes, it's still on the, on the books for uh, after, once we build our office building, which we'll be, we'll be moving into the office building a year from now, um, then the next step is to build a gas station convenience store down by, on Boy Scout there. Uh, and then this way, when you come back with your rental car, you can buy some gas instead of paying for it at the rental car place. And then after that, the hotel. So there's, there's many years of development left. And, and, you know, the reason the development is able to happen even is because we built that train that takes you to uh, the rental car center. That enabled all your surrounding real estate. And, and who wouldn't want to be connected to an airport with a, with a four minute train ride? So uh, yeah, it's still on the yeah. books. Great. Mayor Bajowski. 
Thank you for your presentation. I was just curious if you uh, would be able to supply it to our team so that we could get a copy of it. Absolutely. We'll, Thank you. we'll email this to uh, all the members. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Go ahead, Dora. Yes, one question. on. Uh, I saw something, a blurb the other day, British Airways, well, not British Airways, but in the UK that there was some talk about a vaccine passport that would allow UK travelers to come to the US. Have you seen anything on that? There's been, yeah, there's been a lot Thank of you. discussion about that. And uh, um, as a matter of fact, there's, there's one market where uh, you have to get tested before you fly and you have to get tested when you land. Uh, but that's a market that operates to Europe. There are a lot of different hybrids of what you just mentioned, and no one's really settled on the right answer. Um, and I, honestly, I, I think the right answer is going to be uh, vaccine availability. And once you get everybody, as many people as you can, vaccinated, uh, and I don't know whether that'll be uh, April, May, June, uh, I think all of these things become resolved. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yes, Bill. <laughs> Could you hit your uh, microphone, Phil? Yeah. <laughs> is it, um, what makes it a hub? Is it, is it regionals coming in and then people flying out from there, or is it servicing the Caribbean and Mexico, or? It's, we're, we're, yeah, we're, run, we're not really a hub. Uh, we're, we're much more of a O&D, or origin and destination airport, whereas Atlanta, as an example, 80% of the people that go to Atlanta airport aren't <laughs> going to Atlanta. They're connecting. Right. On, in our case, 90, more than 90% of the people who come to TPA are coming to this region only. Yeah. We have some connections when we have Cuba, we have some connections to Cuba, we have some very limited connections to uh, the Caribbean and to Panama, but it's, it's quite limited. So we're really a destination airport. Well, that's what I thought, but I, I thought you had mentioned that <coughs> you were cited as one of the... Oh. Yeah, okay, sorry. I didn't That's where you. I... Yeah, the <laughs> FAA confused. designation as a large hub airport, they, they consider the number of passengers to drive the hub airport designation, okay. not the fact that you're hubbing, uh, hubbing flights. Okay, so, so I was yeah. more correct in my analogy. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a misnomer, right. actually. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Any, anybody else? Joe, thank you for coming okay. over and appreciate your time always. Thank you all. Yeah. Good to see you all. Take care. Take, Take care. care of yourself. Okay, um, moving on to where are we going next? Uh, research. Uh, we're going to research. Before that, though, um, uh, Mayor Julie, we're ahead of the game. Presentation is already on our uh, on our report page, and so it's clickable and downloadable. So just wanted to let Thank Leroy, you. Leroy just let me know that. So I want to make sure we do that. Next up, uh, we have a presentation from Destination Analyst. Destination Analyst is our research company. Um, and I believe Aaron was here about a year ago before everything hit the you know what. Um, and we've asked her to come back and talk with us. Um, however, due to travel restrictions in her state of California, uh, she is joining us via Zoom. But uh, her, her and her company are actively involved in, nationally in understanding what the traveler out there is looking at doing or is doing, and then uh, provides us with a great amount of data that is very useful for us in, in our marketing. So I'm gonna turn it over to Aaron. Uh, welcome, sorry you can't be here, but we are glad to hear everything you're gonna be telling us. Thank you, yeah, let me out of the the prison that's California. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. I hope I hope to be there by next month. Um, so I'm Erin Francis Cummings, President and CEO of Destination Analysts. It's my pleasure to be here with you, albeit virtually, uh, to present important information about the state of traveling consumer sentiment in the United States, a look back on tourism performance in Pinellas County in 2020, and what we can expect for the months ahead. Our team of researchers at Destination Analysts serves the global travel and hospitality industry with insights into audiences, brands, and marketing performance. And we've had the great pleasure of working with Visit St. Pete Clearwater since 2009. 
Let me get this slide moving for you. Okay, on the agenda today, I'll be taking you through the latest findings on the current state of American travel sentiment from our ongoing coronavirus travel sentiment index study and what these findings imply about travel's future. I'll then share a recap of tourism in Pinellas County in 2020, who visited and their economic impact. And then finally, our uh, current forecast for what visitor volume, spending, and overall economic impact may be in 2021. So I'm going to start with what our research tells us about American travel sentiment right now. Um, these are going to be key highlights from our latest coronavirus travel sentiment index. Regularly for the last 49 weeks since the onset of the COVID crisis, March 15th, we've conducted an online survey of 1,200 Americans and produced this index, which provides measures and understanding on how Americans are thinking, feeling, and approaching their decision making when it comes to travel uh, during the pandemic. The people we survey traveled in pre-pandemic time and represent each of the four major regions of the U.S. We survey new travelers each week. And after the data is collected, it's weighted by U.S. geography and demographics. The confidence interval in the top line findings I'll be sharing with you today is plus or minus 2.8%. And my update to you today reflects data that we collected just this past weekend between February 12th and 14th. I'd like you to know this is independently produced by us as a third-party research company, uh, not uh, as uh, a foreign direct support of a specific advertising or marketing agency. Uh, it's done with the singular intention of helping visit St. Pete Clearwater and the greater travel industry navigate and recover from the COVID-19 crisis. So Americans are seeing some great news on the pandemic front. We talked a bit about it this morning, uh, but they were seeing some good news as they answered our questions this past weekend. Daily new cases down significantly uh, from what let's hope was the final peak last month. And deaths uh, also coming down. There's usually a couple week lag behind cases, so we should be seeing a dramatic dip in uh, deaths in the United States from COVID soon. And fortunately, these trends are largely across the entire US. And our uh, vaccinations have run, ramped up, with some estimating that it's nearly certain the pandemic will be under control by summer. So the question, what's the current mood among American travelers? The findings from this week's research on American travelers show five key things. First, concerns about COVID-related health and safety issues. While they're still elevated, they have greatly improved. Second, most Americans remain optimistic that vaccines are the path back to normalcy. Third, Americans are further warming to travel advertising and growing more marketable for travel. Uh, fourth, it won't be a quick pivot back to normalcy. Uh, the pandemic is going to weigh on travel and trip behaviors from some time. And fifth and finally, what I'll be showing you today is that the trends point to Pinellas County continuing to be well positioned uh, in tourism's recovery. So starting with key takeaway number one, concerns about COVID have improved. When Americans are asked how they expect the severity of the coronavirus situation in the U.S. to change in the next month, 22.7% of American travelers feel the situation in the U.S. is going to get worse. That's down from 27% saying that last week. Meanwhile, 39.3% feel the pandemic is going to get better in the U.S., and that's up from 37.9% in just one week. Um, mm -hmm. To see how astonishing this result is in perspective. Um, let's look at it since the start of the pandemic almost a year ago. The orange line is our pessimism line. That's those who feel the coronavirus situation in the U.S. is going to get worse. That's been plummeting over the last six weeks and is now at a record low. The blue line is our optimism line. Uh, those that think the pandemic uh, is going to get better and that is at a record high. Uh, the highest optimism about the pandemic's course in the U.S. has ever been prior to now was the week of May 4th, when 35.1% thought things were going to get better in the next month. But even then, pessimism still outweighed optimism, unlike today, where optimism is the clear winner. And you're going to see the presence of this feeling as a thread throughout American travelers' other emotions, beliefs, and behaviors. <laughs> 
Americans' anxiety about the health impact of the pandemic, that also continues to decline. Uh, this week, 66.3% have high degrees of concern about personally contracting COVID. That's down from 69.7% last week. If we look at this over time, we see this has been on a downward trajectory. 73% of us still have high degrees of concern about our friends and family contracting the virus, but that is down from 76.3% last week. And we see this is also heading down, going down quite significantly over the last month. And these better feelings translate to travel. We've been tracking the safety processions of over two dozen travel and leisure activities. The person perceiving each of these activities as unsafe is showing, uh, being shown to you on this chart right now. If we take the average of those ratings uh, as unsafe, we see that we are at 46.2%. And again, looking at this over the last 49 weeks, you see perceptions of travel activities as unsafe has been on a downward trajectory since reaching uh, a third peak last month and now has hit a record low since the start of the pandemic. And there are many other sentiment records at lows or otherwise on positive downward trends. First, 52.7% of Americans say they don't want travelers visiting their home communities still, but this has been steadily decreasing since the start of the year. Looking at agreement with the inability to enjoy travel right now, this week at 55.7%, and this has been coming down. Loss of interest in travel for the time being at 43.5%, that this continues to fall. Belief that travel should be limited to essential needs only, 49.2% have agreement with that. This is also down over the last weeks. And those who would have travel guilt is at 44%. And this is down uh, significantly from a recent peak, uh, December 14th, when that was at 54.6%. And this week, 31.3% feel confident or very confident that they can travel safely. And if we add in those that are somewhat confident, six in 10 American travelers feel some confidence about safe travel right now. And it, although it hasn't yet surpassed a proportion that are lacking in confidence, those firmly confidence, as you see here, has been rising over the last month. And finally, looking at Americans' mindset around travel, are they ready or are they still hesitant? 58.5% say they are in a travel readiness state of mind. In fact, the proportion of Americans in a travel readiness mindset has grown, while inversely the proportion who are hesitant has shrunk. Which leads me to one of the primary sources of these cheerful feelings. The second major takeaway from this week's study of American travelers uh, while expectations around uh, vaccines may have regressed somewhat, most American travelers are still optimistic that vaccines are the path back to normalcy and will be instrumental in the recovery of their normal travel patterns. The proportion of Americans who say they will not travel until they're able to get a vaccine is currently at 45%. Uh, this is a sentiment that's very receptive to major vaccine news. Uh, so we had a peak in that when the vaccines were announced in the fall, uh, and then it's uh, been coming down. So the percent of Americans who say they won't travel until they get a vaccine has uh, been on the decline as the reality of the rollout set in. Similarly, the percent of Americans who say they will not travel until vaccines are made widely available is at 47.6%, and that's down from 53% last week. Meanwhile, the percent who disagree with the notion that they're going to avoid travel until vaccines are made widely available has been increasing. So it's good that disagreement with that is increasing. And we had a notable drop off in one of our vaccine metrics this week, and that's with the percent who say they will or have already taken one of the COVID vaccines. Uh, although this has declined over the last few weeks from the peak it reached uh, January 25th, we had a uh, sorry about that. We had a larger jump down uh, this week. Um, but I want you to know we altered the question this past weekend a little bit um, to include people who have already been vaccinated. So that's probably play a factor in uh, this uh, jump down this week. Uh, but more importantly, next week or this coming weekend, we plan to research those that say no to this question to get more specific 
reasons as to why uh, they're uh, saying uh, no to uh, getting the current uh, vaccines. Um, and so, as with the percent who said they would get vaccinated, the percent of parents with school age children that said they'll have their children take one of the currently available vaccines, uh, that did drop down to 43.5% from 52.9%. Uh, the declines do not largely appear to be due to safety perceptions. 62.5% of the American traveling population believes the current COVID-19 vaccines are safe. And although that's down slightly from last week, you can see if we look over time, it's been remained relatively consistent uh, since December. So again, we'll be looking more into what's going on there. Maybe that metric will jump back up uh, this coming week. Uh, and despite the decrease in saying they're gonna take one of the currently available vaccines, 58.6% of Americans credit the current COVID vaccines uh, for their optimism about life returning to normalcy in the next six months. <laughs> Similarly, well over half of travelers uh, say that the current vaccines make them more optimistic about being able to travel safely in the next six months. And nearly three in 10 say they have started planning travel specifically in anticipation of wide vaccine distribution. <laughs> And one slight but very important increase we did see this week was the percent of American travelers with friends or family who have already received their COVID vaccine. 54% of American travelers currently have vaccinated friends or relatives. And if we look at those who know someone who got vaccinated by generation and by region, we see the rate greatens with age as well as residents in the western half of the U.S. Uh, and this is an important metric to keep your eye on for travels recovery, because if we look at people that know someone who has been vaccinated, it clearly impacts their sentiment. They're more optimistic about their travel future. They are doing more travel dreaming and they have more trips planned for this year. In terms of their own vaccination, nearly half of Americans who have yet to receive uh, the vaccine expect that they are going to get their vaccine by June. And you can see how this timing plays out in their travel plans. So this chart is showing you the months that Americans have at least tentative trip plans in right now. And you see how relatively modest the next few months are. And then we have our leap in uh, May and July uh, looking like the peak travel month this year. Uh, but the subsequent months following July also still holding strong. So again, uh, a lot of Americans think they'll be vaccinated by June. So now the third major takeaway from this week's study, Americans are further warming the travel advertising and growing more marketable for travel. We've calculated a travel marketing potential influence uh, for the uh, index for the last 49 weeks using these four important metrics indicating one's openness to and ability to travel. So first one's a level of concern for personally contracting COVID and their financial anxiety, then their level of openness to travel inspiration and their level of excitement to travel right now. And the resulting index from that is used to help predict how marketable Americans overall are for travel and uh, from which segments uh, being more or less so. So first I'm going to show you, this is a, a normal non-pandemic time. Uh, this is how uh, the American traveling public would look um, in terms of their marketability for travel. Uh, we usually have a welcome unevenness on the right side of this curve. Um, usually Americans are more marketable for travel than not marketable for travel. Mm -hmm. um, today, Americans travel marketability looks uh, like this. Overall, the index is still uh, skewing heavier to the left, less marketable, but there is important movement downwards on that side and modest uh, but important upwards movement on the right towards marketability. <laughs> And we use this index to track a number of traveler segments. I, I know it's impossible to read right now, but I just wanted to show you them all together to see uh, the trend line. We don't have any particular traveler segment uh, hit the highly, highly marketable uh, benchmark yet during the pandemic. Uh, but you can see the story of the pandemic in this chart. Beach heights in uh, marketability in June after the first surge, again in the early fall after the second surge, and now we're heading up again, which again is hopefully <laughs> the last after the last uh, final surge. Uh, and we believe this suggests a much more fertile environment for travel advertising and marketing. In addition to indexing higher for travel marketability, Americans are actively 
travel, dreaming, and planning. In the last week alone, more than 60% of Americans have done something related to travel, including daydreaming about a trip, researching travel ideas online, and talking to their friends and family about trips. American travelers have been able to recall seeing travel advertisements at a significantly higher rate as of late compared to earlier months in the pandemic. We peaked last week at nearly four in 10 recalling a travel ad. Uh, that's down to one third this week, but still well above the fall. And when we asked them how the last travel ad they saw made them feel, 38.9% said that it made them happy or very happy, leaning heavier towards very happy. And their happiness response to travel ads has grown six percentage points since back in December. And right now, 39.1% said they'd be happy to see an ad promoting their own community as a place for tourists to come visit. And although this has been on a slight downward trend over the past few weeks, it still significantly exceeds the 29.1% said they'd be unhappy seeing an ad promoting their own home for tourism. And travel ads, they work. Well over a quarter of all American travelers and over 35% of those millennial age or younger say that an ad has specifically motivated them to travel to a destination in the past. Mm -hmm. And as we think more about travel advertising, it's important to consider our fourth key takeaway from this research on American travelers. Uh, it's not gonna be a very quick pivot back to normalcy. So we see that the pandemic uh, is still gonna weigh on travel and trip behaviors uh, for some time. We asked a series of questions about Americans' planned travel in the next three months. When we ask about the number of regional trips they're going to take, that is those within 250 miles of their home, we can see that the vast majority of Americans' planned leisure trips in the next three months are going to remain regional. And while cities and urban destinations uh, show important signs of recovery as aspirational destinations, Americans are still as likely to go to rural areas and beach destinations as cities on their upcoming travel. And that's just something that we never used to see in pre-pandemic times when cities always were largely on top. And while hotels overall, will, you know, they will be the most popular lodging choice, uh, we do still see a high percentage say they're going to stay with friends or relatives, uh, as well as Airbnbs and vacation home rentals uh, remaining common. And it does uh, also not look likely that we'll have a quick return to the freewheeling high spending days of 2019. Half of American travelers taking trips in the next three months say they're going to be more budget conscious uh, when it comes to their travel spending. We ask those with trip plans over the next three months about the actions they're going to take as a result of the ongoing pandemic. We still see sizable numbers say they're going to seek less crowded places, visit outdoor destinations. Uh, there's still some avoidance of air travel and just traveling less overall. Uh, nevertheless, overall, the trends we see point to Pinellas County continuing to be well positioned in tourism's recovery and outperforming uh, national benchmarks. First, when Americans express what's important to them in terms of experiences they want to have on their trips this year. They say things that the St. Pete Clearwater area either has in abundance uh, and is well known for or both. Fun, relaxation, outdoor recreation, connecting with nature, food and culinary and cultural experiences. Uh, and I want you to keep these elements of high importance to travelers in mind when I show you in a few minutes uh, how uh, visitors, uh, your visitors say being in Pinellas County makes them feel. When we ask Americans to tell us in an open-ended format where they most want to visit this year, Florida comes in first. And this isn't just a far-off maybe. When we ask where they daydreamed about visiting just in the last week, we see Florida on the top of this list too. And finally, when we ask Americans about their likely visitation to the St. Petersburg Clearwater area in the next three years, 21.7% of of all American travelers say they have aspirations to visit your area. So that's a larger trend in sentiment. I'm going to recap tourism in Pinellas County in 2020 now, who visited and what was tourism's economic impact. Um, just a brief overview of the methodology uh, used in this analysis. We designed this research plan and economic model custom to Pinellas County. Um, we started performing our analysis in 2017 with 2018 being our first full year. 
One primary component is an ongoing in-person visitor survey our team conducts at 17 sites and attractions around the county. In 2020, we surveyed nearly 3,900 tourists to Pinellas County. We also survey Pinellas County residents about hosting visiting friends and relatives. We also use a plethora of other secondary data as inputs into our economic model of course, things like hotel and vacation rental room inventory, occupancy rates, tax receipts. So first, I'm going to start with the economic impact of tourism to Pinellas County uh, in this most uh, unusual uh, year. <laughs> uh, our model starts with estimating the number of visitors and visitor days. Pinellas County saw a total of 12.5 million visitors between January and December 2020. The largest segment of the visitor volume uh, were day trip visitors from the surrounding region. Uh, that comprised 4.7 million visitors or 38% of all visitors. And that's up uh, from 26% uh, in 2019. Uh, the, this uh, pandemic caused shift in visitor composition towards day trips from regional residents did play uh, an important role in tourism's ultimate economic impact in 2020. 3.6 billion in direct spending was generated inside the county by visitors uh, between January and December 2020. And just illustrative of the dramatic different impact of the hotel guests versus a regional day tripper. Hotel guests who stayed overnight commercial lodging in the county during their trip were responsible for 1.6 billion in visitor spending during a year or of that total, 44.5%. Uh, so we see how important getting people to come and, and stay overnight is in the, the economic um, impact that they leave behind. And when we look at the distribution of visitor spending, or what we call share of wallet, lodging and restaurants represent the two largest spending categories. Um, and of course, the tourism industry in Pinellas County generates more economic impact than just simply from direct visitor spending. There are, there's uh, indirect impact, such as hotels using a local vendor for dry cleaning services, and induced impact money that comes into a hotel and then is distributed to its local employees as income that they then spend in the county on those effects as well. So when we add in induced and indirect effects the total economic impact of tourism to Pinellas County in 2020 amounted to 5.8 billion. And Pinellas County's tourism industry generated 219 million in tax revenues for governmental entities in 2020. Taxes directly generated by the visitor industry include revenues from the transient occupancy tax, sales taxes, and property taxes paid on lodging facilities. And breaking these uh, economic impact estimates down by uh, quarter and comparing that to 2019 um, helps us understand the journey that Pinellas County went through last year. Coming out of 2019, one of the strongest years for the global travel industry, uh, the, the airport chart showed that too, uh, which makes uh, 2020 even more heartbreaking. But the first quarter of 2020, we saw strong visitor traffic and spending in the county, despite that latter half of March being impacted by the onset of COVID. Uh, the second quarter uh, was the strongest impacts of the pandemic nationwide. Uh, Pinellas County, no exception, with the saw hotel occupancy go down 60% from previous years and then proportional losses and overall visitor volume and spending. But the last six months of 2020 uh, were a different story. Americans looking for a place to escape their boredom, um, the strong pandemic safe appeal of beach destinations, uh, the, your easy access and the opening of your new St. Pete Pier. We saw Pinellas County visitor traffic in terms of uh, volume uh, recover to close to normal levels. Um, however, that travel makeup changed. We had an increase in regional day, trip, day trippers and a decrease in overnight visitors. And since hotel guests are the highest spending visitor segment, even though volume uh, recovered uh, rather quickly, overall visitor spending in the county did not rebound at the same speed and was still down over 30% by the end of the year. <laughs> Uh, and comparing the 2020 calendar year overall to 2019, visitor volume was down about 18%, while economic impact was down about 35%. So who is it that visited the St. 
in Cape Clearwater area in 2020. Um, so I've alluded there were indeed some changes to the overall visitor picture, um, but also some great similarities too. I'll run through this quickly. Demographically, the visitor looked relatively the same as 2019 or normal times in terms of age, income, and ethnicities. However, visitors in 2020 were actually likelier to be married rather than single. Uh, and as you would expect, given the pandemic and travel restrictions, international composition of uh, visitors was was way off. And perhaps most notably, um, St. Uh, Pete Clearwater visitors in 2020 were much likelier to be in-state travelers, Florida residents. Uh, your top out-of-state markets remained the same, Ohio, Michigan, New York, but there were far more Floridians visiting uh, the area than in years past. So looking at how visitors plan their trips to the area, in 2020, the average visitor to the county made their decision to visit approximately six and a half weeks or 45.4 days in advance of their actual travel day. This is a 25 day shorter planning window than in 2019. Uh, what drives the decision to visit the area though remain largely the same, beaches, your beauty, your weather. Um, the resources they used to plan their trip did not uh, shift significantly either. And looking at the details of their trip, um, three quarters of visitors arrived to the area by personal uh, vehicle, over a quarter arrived by airline. And that's about half of what we saw in 2019. Travel groups look similar uh, to 2019. 2.6 people, we had one in five visiting with uh, children, uh, most commonly traveling as a couple. And compared to 2019, though, fewer uh, St. Pete Clearwater visitors stayed overnight. Uh, in 2020, we just had 31.8% uh, stay overnight, uh, so lower than in 2019. Um, and that's going to impact uh, the average uh, amount of time uh, that they spent in the area relative to 2019. Visitor spending was at 21664 per travel party, down slightly. Uh, from 2019. Um, they um, continued to participate in a variety of activities during their trip, uh, but most commonly, as you saw from the, the sheriff wallet, um, dining in restaurants, um, visiting the beach, and going shopping. Uh, visitors in 2020 were far less likely to be first time Florida or St. Pete Clearwater area visitors, a total of 2.9%. Uh, were in the state of Florida for the first time, uh, and one in five were in the St. Pete Clearwater area for the first time. Uh, the average visitor in 2020 said they had made 9.1 previous trips to the area. That's up from an average of eight in 2019. And of course, uh, critical to uh, your ongoing performance uh, is how satisfied your visitors are left feeling after experiencing your destination. When asked what they liked most about the area, as was in the case in 2019, beaches are cited most. Uh, one third say they like everything about the St. Pete Clearwater area. These are their their uh, unaided direct responses to this question. Uh, we don't supply them these answer choices. This is just what they say. And when asked the one word or phrase that best describes how they feel when they're in the area, uh, remember what I showed you is important uh, to people and what they have as a travel experience right now. Uh, and so relaxed uh, was far and away the top emotion that's evoked by being in Pinellas County, followed by happy. And nearly all visitors report being very satisfied with their experience in the destination. They also reported high likelihood to return. Oops, sorry about that. Uh, and very importantly, the average visitor rated their likelihood to recommend the St. Pete Clearwater area to other travelers is at 9.8 on a 10 point scale. So just really excellent, outstanding visitor satisfaction metrics here. Uh, so I'll wrap up with looking ahead uh, our forecast for the next eight months. Uh, this forecasting model for tourism impact ut utilizes our primary data from the ongoing visitor profile study and lines it with current projections for hotel occupancy and performance in Pinellas County from STR. And of course, also includes other sources of economic indicators. <laughs> So hotel occupancy is currently projected to be at or above 2020 levels starting next month in March and reaching 61.7% in July. 
However, uh, like national trends so far, hotel occupancy in Pinellas County is not projected to reach 2019 or 2018 levels this year. Uh, I think the last uh, national forecast said uh, 2023 uh, for uh, hotel occupancy returning to 2019 levels. Uh, but you're likely to be a, a ahead of that. Uh, a similar pattern is expected for overall visitor volume. This forecast takes into account that as the year progresses and vaccines become more widely distributed, the proportions of regional day trippers as well as those staying with visitor friends and or staying with friends and relatives, those are going to return to historically similar patterns. Um, so right now we. Uh, we project that visitor volume will be at 13.7 million for 2021. Total economic impact generated by tourism to Pinellas County is expected to be above 2020 levels starting in April. Uh, reaching uh, 2019 levels is still likely a year or more away. Uh, we see the first three months of 2021 are going to be behind 2020, um, but then we'll exceed 2020 levels for the remainder of the year. And we're um, projecting uh, tourism impacts uh, to be 6.4 billion. Uh, same story for taxes generated for governmental entities in the county. Taxes followed economics uh, and we're looking at 236 million. So with that, I thank you for having me virtually with you in the meeting. Again, hope to be with you in person uh, next month. And cheers to recovery. Yeah, Aaron, you're going to be able to stay with us, right, yeah, for a little Aaron, bit? Yes, right? Yes, okay. I'm here. Yeah, Tony Satterfield has a question. Hi, hi, Aaron. Tony Satterfield with the Alden Suites. I always enjoy your presentations. They're they're very thorough. Uh, but you sort of answered one of my questions, and that was we had just had a presentation done by uh, Tampa Airport. Um, and is there a reluctance for people to get on an airplane as opposed to get in a car to take a vacation? I noted that 28% said avoid. Is that number up or down from previous surveys? Um, so that said number is down, fortunately. It's not heading down dramatically. Uh, so I think we'll still continue to see avoidance of air travel by some segments of the traveling population, but people will be returning uh, to air travel. We see, uh, it, the, again, you know, vaccines are really a critical factor in that. Uh, we see the, how they're planning their travel. There, there's just that bump up in the summer when people think they're going to be vaccinated. And I think that we'll see, uh, uh, of course, more return to air travel then. Uh, but again, one of my points is we, but I don't want to be overly optimistic about a, a quick pivot back to normal because it, it, it may take people some time. You know, there is a number of, of people who are, are more cautious uh, rather than jumping right back in. And then just one other quick question. Um, I think this is a rumor, but there was some talk of a ban by the, I believe it was the federal government, travel into Florida. I think that's just a rumor, but sometimes perception impacts us. Has that slipped into any of your research? Is anybody saying, oh, we're not going to go to Florida because I've heard about this thing? I have not seen that, and Florida is consistently performing so strongly when we ask people where they want to go. Um, so I have not seen that come up. The only negative thing I'll say, and this is not, it's not really that unique to Florida, you know, the other, other states like my state of California, this comes up too. There's a segment and it, luckily it's small. It's like 10% that let politics affect their travel decisions. Okay. Um, and that's the, that's the only negative thing I've, I've really seen in our work okay. about Florida. Okay. Aaron, thank you very much. Mayor Hibbert. Thank you. Aaron, appreciate the great presentation. Two quick questions. First of all, when you look at the percentage of regions and their citizens who are going to get vaccines, the South was the lowest. I don't know where Florida specifically is. But how important do you believe it's going to be for us to market the percentage of Pinellas County residents that, that have been vaccinated? 
Uh, that's a great question, and I, I, it, it's an interesting one too. I, uh, am amazing. We've interviewed a lot of travelers in, in the last year uh, because there's so much you learn by having more in-depth conversation. I would say, based on what travelers tell us, the amount of research they do on the area they're considering visiting in terms of pandemic, I would say there's that. If, if you had that stat noted somewhere on the site that X percent of your residents are vaccinated, I think that can only do you good. I mean, it's incredible the amount of, of, of pandemic-related statistics travelers are looking up before they consider going somewhere. And I think that would make them feel great if they saw, oh my gosh, wow, 80% are vaccinated. Okay, I'll, I'll be safer. I'm hopeful about the forecasts you showed what is the error in those forecasts? Your percent error. I, uh, you know, the the uh, for the model doesn't um, c create some uh, like a a plus or minus on the forecast. Uh, I, will, I will say it's you know it's really highly dependent on what uh, STR, uh, which is an, another kind of gold standard. Uh, in the travel industry, what they are projecting for uh, hotel occupancy, uh, I, 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 they, they are, you know, they're usually very good in their forecasting, and if they if they see any downgrades, they'll they'll let us know. But it's only it's only you know good news right now. Uh, so I am I imagine that we'll be pretty close. Very good. Thank you. Mayor Bajowski. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thanks again for the report. As everybody has said, um, it was a lot to follow. First, I'd love us to get a copy of that. Um, and, and just, uh, Steve, it would be great with something that in-depth to get a copy of it ahead of time, to, because as you go through it so quickly, I'd like to digest it a little bit before, before we come. Um, but my, my question is, is in the beginning of the report, it talked about the number of visitors, and I believe you said 12 million? Yes, let me, or let me sorry, let me grab the, um, it for uh, 2020, grab the visitor So while, while you're looking, while you're looking for that. Um, yes, 12.5. So are, are we calculating that differently? And I, the reason I ask is, is if I remember correctly, in 18 and 19, I think we had like five, eight and change and then five, six and change. So I'm, I'm curious, I, I might be confusing something, but I'm pretty sure total visitors were. The numbers include day trippers. Oh, it includes. That's correct. So Aaron, if you would mind sharing your screen and, and, and the pie chart of the total visitation, uh, that yeah. will help instruct. The 15 million and change is is the total pie, including regional day trippers, locals, uh, traveling uh, day trippers. So somebody staying in Orlando that comes over for the day, and then right, but can, they don't live here in Pinellas County. That's correct. You, you'll you'll see that. Um, oh, she she's going to pull it up. That 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 number you're referencing is is the actual overnight uh, visitor number. The oh. so those who are actually staying overnight in. Um, paid accommodations. Really? Yeah. So uh, here, and so actually, and I apologize, not just paid. The number you're referencing is total overnight. So even those staying with visiting, you know, visiting friends and, and relatives. So there's the breakdown of it, of it there. Um, so then again, uh, the the uh, don't go anywhere. Um, so there's another slide where you talk about the percent of cars being used. That's where I was trying to make some reference because those are the two pages in the past reports I always look at um, whether they're they're utilizing a car when they're here or not. Um, and it looks like that number went down, which is interesting because everybody's talking about people coming here. They're, most people are coming here by car. Not the number, but the percentage. In the past, it's been a little bit higher, the percentage of people coming here by either getting off the plane and renting a car or coming here by car with their personal car. And it looked like that percentage went down. 
So I just thought um, that was you, interesting. I don't. Um, I don't. I don't think. Uh, I. I just checked that looking at nineteen. I just checked that last night, and I, I'm personal car uh, was not uh, down. Um, but uh, when I uh, send this uh, report over to visit St. Um, Pete Clearwater for distribution, uh, I can certainly note that in the transportation, the method of arrival and departure, any differences um, from 2019, we can, again, add those in for you so it's e easier to have those numbers. Um, and I apologize to all of you for hitting you uh, with so much data. I know it was a lot to follow, um, but certainly this is uh, available to you. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yep. And Thank you can always reach out to me with any questions. Any uh, any other questions for Aaron? Okay. Uh, thank you so much for checking in with us, and I really appreciate the report. And um, I'm sure that you'll get a few calls some, with questions. But look forward to receiving that report that you just uh, you just gave us. So thank you. Thank you all. And uh, Commissioner, if I if I might, Go ahead. Um, Aaron did. I mean. I, all, my head was like, uh, Mayor Julie, just like for you, my hair was, head was just going, wow. There was a lot in there um, and a, a lot of takeaways. And yes, this is this will be available as soon as the presentation is over with. She was working on this up until last night uh, to really get everything down. You will, we will have uh, Julie, not Julie, we will have Aaron on at, a, at other TDC meetings on a quarterly basis that will run through what we're seeing from the visitor and the economic impacts. So it's again, a, a good, a, you know, give us a better idea of what's happening. The second part is the data on the COVID, what they've been doing. I mean, 49 weeks they have been doing surveys. So it's quite extensive of what they've been following. And it's been somewhat of a book for us to follow in some of the things that we're doing and what we need to push and, uh, and, and, and shove out. So again, I know it's a lot of information, but it's great information to show where we're at and, and also where we're going. One of the things that up next is I want Leroy to go through on some of the normal research that we show also coming from different sources and some new things that we're also going to be showing on a monthly basis to the group and what that is. So Leroy, if you would cover that. Thank you, Stephen. Good morning uh, to the commission. Uh, just one more note on that data. I uh, that's the first time I've seen a lot of it because, as as Steve said, uh, working on it up until last night, we're trying to bring it to you as quickly as we can. Uh, so yeah, with the close of 2020, basically about six weeks to turn that that report around, and, and the COVID data is is as of uh, Tuesday. So uh, completely get that, and, and pl please. Uh, don't hesitate to follow up with the questions uh, in between now and, and next month's meeting or certainly a next month's meeting. And the other caveat I, I will say is, you know, uh, certainly we're here to present data um, in many different ways, but specifically for how you all and the industry can benefit from that data and, and understanding. So if there's ever, please don't hesitate, ever any view or data that you're saying, you know what, th this is great, but I'd love to see it in this way or answer this question, please don't hesitate either. And to, to touch on what Steve had said, in your packets and, and to the visual on the screen, we, we include a lot of the normal STR data. I'm gonna skip over some of that regular uh, monthly hotel performance to um, the second piece here, if my clicker will work. It was just a minute ago. Um, to the first monthly city segment comparison that you'll see in this chart, and that is uh, the, the larger chart on the screen at the top, uh, at, kind of in, in the middle. You're gonna notice this is new. Uh, what we're trying to do again is break it down even further for not just our understanding, but for the industry's understanding and for you all, you're gonna notice, so, so rather than looking just external, what are our competitive markets doing in state with the traditional STR, occupancy, ADR, and REVPAR. We're breaking this down within Pinellas County. So you can see all of the individual communities. And we've also broken that down by beach and inland. So taken all of the beach properties, put them into one category, and all of the other inland properties into another category. Again, just to help understand the ebbs and flows of the market and the different municipalities. So particularly wanted to draw attention to that 
that chart there. Again, this will be a regular offering each month. Um, as we move forward in that same, same document, you're gonna see a couple new views and charts. Again, if we feel like uh, these are new, these, this is the first time we're kind of bringing this forward to you all into industry, uh, we want to, to dial this in a little bit, but this is, keep in mind, backward looking data. So STR through December, we've, we've isolated here um, demand and supply to understand those, th those trends by month over the course of 2020, that's the top chart. The second chart is isolating occupancy and you're overlaying uh, 2020 versus 19 here. Um, and that's broken down even more granularly to see those, uh, uh, the spikes and the dips, as well as overlaying some supply. Obviously, supply can affect occupancy, so understanding where the supply is and any movements there, that's that horizontal, primarily horizontal line. Um, so again, just trying, especially as we move into the rest of 2021, where understanding what our performance is like not necessarily against 2020, because we, we know that's gonna be a moving target, but against 19, and that's that bottom chart there as well with occupancy. So we, we're overlaying uh, not just against 2020, and you're gonna start to see this move forward for January, February, and throughout 2021 to get the ebbs and flows of that data. Hey, Leroy, on that previous page where you talk about occupancy right. percent change, is that month to month, or is that the previous year's same month? Yeah, so the occupancy, on the, the bottom chart, that occupancy, that's the percentage of the occupancy for that month. Uh, the change isn't listed. Yeah, no, I'm talking about your first page, the, the, the new chart that you gotcha. gave. Yeah, that one there. That is it's correct. So percent change. Percent change year over year. So year December year. 20 okay. versus December 19. Okay. Thank yep. you. So a couple new looks with these charts. Again, feedback is welcome, uh, hoping to make better sense as we work our way through 2021, which is gonna be a hard year to benchmark against 2020. We all know that, so we're trying to dig into this a little bit deeper and in different ways than we have before. The last thing that I wanted to draw attention to on this uh, uh, handout, this, this one before we move to a bit more forecasting, and this is a good transition, is just a reminder of the key data uh, chart that we include in this. Now you guys have seen this before, but I just wanted to reiterate that there is forecasting data in this chart. So we give you uh, three <coughs> months back, the current month and two months forward. So you can start to see at least on the vacation rental side, how we're trending in terms of um, ADR and occupancy on the books as of the date the report was pulled. So you can start to get a bead on uh, how that business is trending as we sit here today, which if I may, I, we're, we're kind of at an interesting point because for the next month or so, a lot of this data is gonna give us real time how we were trending last year because COVID didn't start to impact really bookings and our destination until mid-March. So really the rest of February, a lot of this data is really good data to see, okay, are we on pace for April prior to the bottom falling out? And you'll see in a lot of the, a lot of the data, we're not on pace, we're, we're actually uh, doing pretty well. Um, if we would, we can go to the next, the next PDF uh, back there. Um, this one is entirely new. Again, hang with me. There's going to be some uh, spaghetti plot here. But uh, want your feedback and, and, again, trying to get into more of the forecasting and the projections. Uh, Aaron uh, and D DA, which does amazing work, presented one set of forecasting. That's taking into account a number of sources, one of which is STR. And so this is the STR forecast isolated. Um, what we're doing here, again, is overlaying past performance, which is left of the dotted line projection in the top two charts of occupancy ADR RevPAR, and trying to give you two years of a view to understand those trends. And then looking forward, STR gives us projections for ADR, RevPAR, and occupancy out to next May. And so that's what you're seeing in, in, as far as those projections are concerned. You can see we've, the top chart is a bit complex. We tried to simplify it in the next two where we're isolating just ADR and RevPAR in the second one and purely just occupancy in the third one um, with, with it going out, sorry, all the way to June. 
So you can see the rest of this year, at least the at SDR forecast, not quite to 2019 levels. The 2022 forecast getting closer to those 19 levels. But this is a big piece of what the DA forecast is. And again, trying to help us understand where we're headed um, moving forward. One other piece that we want to start bringing to you monthly in the industry is the forecasting with Travel Click. We've talked about Travel Click a lot. We finally got it kind of into a place that I think is helpful for people to consume. And that is looking at um, occupancy change for both leisure travel and meetings and group travel um, moving forward. So you can see we've, we've provided uh, several months of data in, in arrears, but also for the rest of February, March, and April and how those months are trending versus last year. So uh, at, at the time of this, this report, which was about a week ago, the latest data we got, you can see total occupancy for March is projected right now as of rooms booked is, is down 38%. And what makes up that 38%? Down 22% on the leisure side. And now, no surprise, we all know this story, unfortunately, down 80, almost 89% on the groups, group and meeting side. Again, we have this data and, and, and can help uh, supply it to you all in weekly and daily form. We're trying to, to simplify this, provide it in month format to, to understand how we're, how we're forecasting. And the chart below that is the same data uh, just visualized. So you can start to see how that, um, how that business looking forward is made up. Not to do too much data too early in the morning, but here we are. Great stuff. I, al I always do it to you, I'm sorry. Um, one last thing, and this is backward looking data. It's not a pretty chart. We are going to make, make this uh, uh, prettier moving forward. That is arrivalist. You guys have heard us talk about arrivalist before, and I've got some arrivalist data in our Super Bowl recap that I'll touch on in a bit. The, the, this is, uh, these are arrival markets um, for 2020. Um, and it breaks it down by top origin markets by fly market, drive market, and then year to date. So sorry, the top two are December, the bottom two are year to date for 2020. And this is um, cell phone movement, smartphone uh, data that they're able to pull. We're gonna start providing you this again on a monthly basis so you can look back and see, okay, what was January? What's our year to date? What are those markets looking like? Leroy, just a quick question. Yeah. Is that year to date? Is that calendar or physical? So that's going to be January 2020 to December 2020. Thank you. Yep. Um, and, and obviously, this is excluding any in state visitation. Um, otherwise, in state would be dominating the drive, uh, the drive categories. Yeah. Um, thank you, Leroy. Uh, so now that we know spring training is happening, any effect on, from that? that you feel might might come? You know, I, I think one thing we've seen with not just web traffic and consumption of events on our website, but also uh, consumer behavior is people want an excuse to get out of the cold and to attend an event, get outside and do that however safely and possibly they can. So um, yeah, I would say there's definitely going to be an impact to, to what degree, and I'll be honest, I'm not completely up to date on of, you know, how many tickets in the, the fan experience, but. Um, well, we have very limited. I sure. mean, I think we're at about 1,000 or 1,500. What, you guys are at 2,200 over there? Correct. Yeah, so. Not I mean, including the berm. Yeah, so we don't, it's, it's limited. Uh, and of course, for us, there's a travel ban in Toronto. I mean, they, yep. they can leave, but they, you know, they have all these they're, restrictions that they're are. They're gonna be staying for a while if they leave, yeah. Yeah, so, but. Um, and then in our case, you know, there's conversation about regular season starting here. Yep. Yep. So, yeah. I mean, obviously, the, you know, we talk about the regular season, and I believe, I believe we've got a meeting, meeting with the Blue Jays this week uh, to talk about, uh, you know, because there, there is a relationship with the capital funding and the, sure. and the marketing deliverables there. Uh, but, yeah, I would say no doubt anything that adds to that destination experience and is a potential pull or draw for, for people from up north to escape the winter that, that's, that's happening is no doubt a, a positive. Um, and then the other question I was looking at, um, and I love the, the report that uh, 
you have for the city stuff um, that you reported on, the, on that page right here? Yep. That's good. It, it would be helpful if that, at the bottom of that you can put the overall so you can kind of look at it real quickly and see okay. up or down, you know, yep. if you're running behind or ahead. Um, we can do that. I think one other thing that might be helpful, and now that you're saying that, is obviously STR represents hotels, hotel lodging. Well, that's what was my next question. Is, it, is, is the STR including um, vacation rentals? It does no. not. Uh, but what we can do is look to segment out exactly how we have done here. Um, and I don't know, I can't speak to the exact capabilities off the top of my head. And Jeffrey, I know, is watching and listening. And a kudos to Jeffrey Fowler, who's on my team, who has done a lot of the work around this. Um, is that we can present key data information. We should be able to present key data information broken down similarly than we have done here for the hoteliers. And, and I think it would be very appropriate given yes. that there are so many in our county. I think we should be watching that. No doubt. Thank no you. Doubt. Mayor Hibbert. Thank you, Chair. Um, just two questions. First of all, can not on a monthly basis, but on a quarterly basis, could we get data on jurisdictions? and what they're bringing in on bed tax. I'd like to see how we're trending specifically on Clearwater Beach for my yep. own edification. Um, and the other thing is, do we ever, I've been gone for eight years, so do we ever look at what inventory is doing overall with hotels and also vacation rentals? Yeah, so real quick on the first one, bed tax, we already visualize it by municipality. We don't bring that forward to this group, but we can. That's easy. That's we can add that to the chart easy next well, month, I, Mayor. If you and we just can do said that it to me, maybe nobody else cares. I'm just interested. I, I think it's a, a very good question and, and piece we can add to this report. So by month collection, and then you'll see it broken down by municipality. The caveat is there are some municipalities that collect um, don't collect enough to be listed broken out separately, but they are kind of aggregate with a couple others. Well, one of the you know, talking points I'm always trying to deal with with our city is how important the beach is. We spend a lot of money on the beach, uh, and there's questions why. Uh, but as I tell people, it's the golden goose, so you try to feed it because we want the eggs. So it would be beneficial to have that data. Certainly, we can start bringing that forward next month. Um, as far as the, the, the supply, yes, that there's no doubt, and that's... Um, Partly, you know, for some of some of the visualization you're seeing here, which is the supply on the occupancy chart, for instance, because if uh, large amounts of rooms are going off or coming 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 on, uh, that's going to impact the occupancy number. So we do keep an eye on that. Um, you'll notice there was a huge drop in supply last April, and that was because there were temporary closures of hotels uh, because of COVID. But um, yes, we do monitor that. Mr. Kimball. Um, yes, that's the next few months are going to be interesting with your information you provide because we were closed for six to eight weeks. Yeah. Hotel, mo most of the hotels were uh, on it. But I'd just like to say to you and Jeffrey, thank you. I mean, we're getting more and more each meeting. And I think this has been the highlight, this one to hear. And where you're talking about not just the past that we've used to go to, but now you're forecasting looking ahead and you're breaking down beaches and communities and everything. Leroy, Jeffrey, I think you're doing fantastic. This is great. Can't wait till next month. <laughs> <laughs> Thank but, you for that. Uh, you're really showing us where we are, and when you answer questions from municipalities on more information, I think it's great uh, for everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Leroy? Anything else, Leroy? I'll be back. <laughs> okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, finance updates, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. In uh, to help with um, not only um, those that are here in the room, but also in about in in public, 
we've actually uh, gone through and put some of the finan the financial information that you have in your eight and a half by eleven. I also have it up in in PowerPoint, so you can look at it at both places. It's the same information. I just uh, if I tried to put the eight and a half by eleven up, it, you wouldn't be able to see it. It'd be too too small. So in the financial update, uh, the first page that we go to looks at revenue um, and. On the TDT collections for December, the TDT that was collected was down 23.9%. Year to date, it is down 20.6%. One of the things that I, that I did is plugged in that data and then and took the last four years and then see where we were at the same time period. Um, and right now, it uh, so yeah, you got the right. Okay. Yeah, but this is oh, the, this is, oh, oh. You gotta remember to click. Yeah. <laughs> it, oops. Thank you, Commissioner. It, almost like the unmute button, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, the, it, when we look ahead, or we look at the last three months, we are almost mirroring what was done in fiscal year 2017. We're a little bit ahead. So if we were to take that out the next nine months, projection wise, we'd be right at about 54 million. And what you can see here under the line total taxes and the budget, we're looking at almost 52 million. So we'd be a, a little bit ahead. Again, you know, 20, we, how are we doing better than 2020? But you also wanna look at 2019. Um, and again, cause that was the, a, you know, a, a banner year. Out under revenue as well, under CVB revenue cooperative sales, you'll see right now there is zero there and we have a budget of 263,000. On that, in checking with, with staff, um, uh, it is very unlikely that we will hit that number and that is primarily due to the fact that a lot of our hotel partners um, are not participating in things because of financial reasons. And so we're picking up that load to make that, make that happen. Look for that to potentially change as we go to fiscal year 22, but I did want to go through and, and point that out. So uh, tax, uh, TDT wise, we are down uh, year to date 20.6%. Um, as we move into March, and then April, May, we should start doing better because at that point we're going against 2020 and the, the pandemic. Under expense for uh, personnel, uh, so if you look at four months of expenses, this is Janu October through January, uh, we should be but at expense level wise of 33%. So you can see that we're below that overall. Uh, both on salaries, uh, benefits, and what have you. And that is uh, the fact that we have um, uh, positions that we have, have not filled. Um, and so we have this, the savings there. And then in addition to that, um, under the capital invoice pro processing and activations, um, that dollar amount is lower. And primarily the fact is that we did not have the capital program um, this year. Under operating expense, um, in this case, uh, a couple of the ones I want to point out, repairs, printing, office, and I know I'm going to sound, li and, uh, sound like a broken record on some of these, is the fact that, um, uh, again, with limited office usage, uh, we don't have repairs and maintenances that we need to do or printing from the office, office supplies. The fact that um, uh, less use of the credit card, um, as well as the fact we're not advertising for vacancies, uh, has that dollar amount lower. On training and education, what training we ha are doing is done virtually and based on associations that we belong to, whether it be a Visit Florida or Destinations Florida or Destinations International, whatever it might be, a lot of what they're offering is at no charge. And typically you would have gone to that meeting where you would have um, uh, been part of the, that education group. So again, uh, savings there. Um, 
And then travel, again, on this one is less in-person events. So uh, right now, that co the cost for that um, is way down. That is starting to pick up. We are starting to see more and more of our industry events going to an in-person event, but it's still uh, not the full complement of things. In fact, I just saw one uh, last night where they had anticipated opening up their trade shows uh, this year. They have now have said, no, we'll look at it for, for fiscal year 22. So again, it's kind of following what we're seeing in the, the travel industry um, overall. And then when we get to, uh, all right, so when we get to promotional expense, a couple of items under advertising and marketing, um, and also under digital marketing, a couple of things to keep in mind. One is the expense is based on when it was paid and not when it is, is run. So usually we're about two to three months behind, depending on what outlet we're dealing with. So, um, so in, in the case of advertising, there's a lot we've already placed. It's just we have not gotten the proper backup and the billing and the receipts for us to go through and process it. So again, that may come two or three months after that has, has run. Uh, same thing on the, the digital um, uh, marketing side. Under elite events, um, on that one is uh, we were budgeted at uh, $1 million. Um, however, uh, right now we've had four events cancel. Uh, because of concerns related to COVID. So there would not be any funds going out for that. Um, and some of the events that have been funded, we don't have the backup yet for them uh, going forward. So again, uh, it's more of, of a timing issue for the chambers uh, on the, the, our chamber agreements. Uh, the operational marketing costs are funded up front, and then we come back on the other end and any of the, uh, the uh, remaining dollars, uh, then they go through and submit uh, six months after the year and then at the, end of, at the end of the fiscal year. And then again, with direct sales, um, in-person trade shows, we're just getting back, uh, back up on that one. So right now, if we are attending things, it's done virtually. The cost to do that is a lot less than actually traveling in person. Um, you know, I'll give you a, a great example. There was one, one conference where they said it could be, I'm going to make up the number, $200 to go attend per person, or you could do your whole staff for $1,000. So again, it's more in that virtual environment. So that's what we're dealing with. Again, we're starting to see that come back. Um, and so we should see that number pick back up, but by year in, not to the level that, that we um, have, have budgeted. Um, and then the last one is under uh, capital funding. And again, that's uh, to the finance statement that, that you have um, and what has been spent to date and, and committed and then uh, where we're at with that. So that is the financial report. Um, are there any questions from, from the group? Tony. Uh, yes, Tony. Yeah. Um, that's the first I've heard about when it's paid as opposed to expense. Um, so that you answered my question as to why we have that very large number under uh, digital marketing. But is there a reason that we can't accrue for some of this stuff? Maybe that's a question for, for Jim. And, and I say that because if this represents a campaign, for example, that we ran fall, you know, how are we tying the results of that back to that particular number? in that it's not being expensed or, or paid until, uh, until January. Or maybe we are, and, and I'm not, I'm missing that. Yeah, so if I understand the question correctly, is do we, look, do we take a look at an expense and say we've already spent that, and therefore what were results related to that, even, even though on the finance statement it doesn't show? And I almost want to say that you almost keep the two correctly. And I, I know, um, is Maria here? 
Yep, she's here, and maybe she can help ans answer that as well. Um, I can, Tony, I can tell you in other locations I've been at, it's based on, hey, when the expense hit, right. but then we can go back and look at it and say, well, we've budgeted X amount, right. and we've, we've committed future commitments to do that or whatever that dollar amount is. So in the case of Katie, um, I, I know I can go back and say, you know, hey, Katie, what do we have? Let, you know, what have we spent already committed to with BVK? And then this is what's actually been expensed already, and this is what we have left. It's just it's not reported on the financial statement. Well, because the other concern is that this could be if you paid for things in November, December that actually reflected the year previously, it just, it just seems like this is muddying the waters and, uh, you know, that's, I, I, did I get to put a question in there? You're correct, Steve. Uh, what you're seeing is the report, it comes from our clerk's finance division. Okay. So what happens is we pull that report and you're seeing it, but there we do have other spreadsheets where we know that we've placed uh, an ad or you know whatever, and then we're just waiting for expense. See, you're looking at the clerks and they're two months behind. Okay. But we do have other spreadsheets to show that we placed an ad. This is what we have from it and it's being ready to be expensed. So this, these expendit expenditures of 1.1 under digital could very well be back from, were back in November. They were actually Correct. placed, Correct. Would, be the, would be the word. Correct. Okay, and so then the second question is, are we tying these numbers then back to, if, if that campaign was running November and December, we should be tying revenue numbers or bed tax collections or whatever they are back to that and are we doing that so on, on that part to give you a great example like from the digital side uh -huh. we go and spend x amount of dollars for a digital campaign on whatever platforms that are out there leroy then can come back and he reports on that on a monthly basis to say here's the campaign that we have running here's the results that we have running from that campaign so let's say we have an ad on sojourn Here's how many, you know, here's how many people we got coming in. Here was the here was the impact in terms of the spend. And then we can always take what we spent and tie it back to that. It may not be right on the financial sheet, but we can look back at it by the different programs we do. D Leroy, did I get that right? Yeah. We're structured monthly. It's yeah. very differently than what you're seeing here. Okay, I guess where I got confused was the financials. You know, I, I do see you guys tying things back, but that the confusing part is this is a couple months behind. So, okay, thank you very much. Yeah. These, these essentially are shown as expensed, not accrued. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. any, any other questions? Uh, so really, this, these, these numbers here, percent of budget, really is compared to the, since we're January, a big number, 33% is what we would normally see. So it shows we're way behind on revenues closer on expenses because we have a lot of fixed expenses that we pay every month. Yes, sir. Okay, so maybe at the beginning, under, after January, just put a parenthesis and say 33%, and when the next time we see it, it'll be 56%, and that number we can always refer to as okay. for that particular month that we're looking at All right. year to date. So We'll be glad to do that. Um, yes, Chuck. Well, first of all, to Tony's point, um, you can't really compare what you did in October dollar-wise to your oh. revenues in that same month because you're really advertising for the future. So tying it back to the buy campaigns, definitely a better way to go. Um, and I'm concerned about the accrual side of things. So we're reporting expenses in November that occurred in September, or I didn't quite follow that. Are we, accru are we accruing the expenses? In other words, we have a campaign say in September, which I know is probably not much, but we pay that bill in October. So is that reported on a cash basis that we had that expense in October, or is it an accrual basis on the books already for September? Is that a valid question? <laughs> there's, yeah, there's open-ended expenses from the previous year always. So they, go ahead. No, I'm just 
listening. I'm listening. Well, I could step right into a lot of mud. You might have already answered that. I just, <laughs> I, get it. I just know that we have a lot of unex, you know, unpaid for expenses that have already happened the previous year. So we have to reconcile that at the, be, at, you know, at the beginning of the year. So we're paying, a, 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 I've been imagining that the expenses in the year that we're paying for are the ones that are actually expended that year. That we make some kind of other adjustment for previous years expenses so that we don't bleed those into the, our numbers for the current year but i, I mean I'm, that is correct okay uh, so it is accrual or no 95 percent of our expenses are paid in the fiscal year yes there are some expenses that we don't have all the backup or you know they haven't showed us what what we've gotten for that expense no i'm not we looking for that i'm just strictly the numbers to... strictly the numbers the accounting i have i i advertise in december i don't pay those advertising bills until january i'm on a fiscal calendar year so <clears throat> i report those expenses in december even though i didn't pay them they're account payable that i have to pay in january right they already reported in december even though because i think what's confusing is the report that you guys see it comes out of our system called opus and it in order for that um uh, report to uh come about it it has to wait until everything is paid so, so that's why it lags two months but we do have our own spreadsheets where we show that this expense happened it was occurred and right. this is we show it so on you have accrual data right. this is cash accounting basically uh, i guess you can look at it that way yeah yeah and again uh i think there are some you said that the way you do it is you put it in an account payable or account i guess a payable okay. it's still at the end of the year so that when you pay it the the next in january you're paying against a payable as opposed to right. an expense in that month for an expense that's in that particular right. year. I want to expense it in December, not wait until yeah. January. That's I think that's what they're trying to do the same thing here. They're yeah. trying to keep they, the expenses to the year that they're being expended. Right. Mm -hmm. If you're paying for something the previous year, it doesn't really show up as an expense this year. It shows yeah. up as a taking care of a payable from the end of last year. Right. So, well, that's the way it should be done. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's what Just they're trying to Just making sure we were all on a cash basis that we need to match revenues expenses for the for the same year. Yeah, and we are. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Any any other oh, sorry, Chuck, yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my question is on the revenue side. This report um, is October through January, four months. And if you look at the bold total taxes collected for that four month period, it shows it's six million six oh one and change. Um, when in fact, if you look at the um, tax collector sheet that we got, we see in October net, we collected uh, three, almost three and a half million, November, three million, December, almost three and a half million. And then if you look back at the, the budget, we can see for the first time January's numbers reported here for January actuals, also in bold, sixth line down, says three point or 3,071,000. So anyway, three, six, nine. So you're at about 13, a little over $13 million in total revenue for October for, through January, when in fact it says 6 million six. I'm just trying to figure out where the, uh, where the delta is of that missing, it's not missing, but just the unreported $6 million in, in gross income. What, what's reporting on the on his on uh, Jim? You have to speak into that thing. Yes. I'm what's, sorry. Uh, what's being reported on um, on the report is what's been collected by January 31st of of 2021. Uh, the report you're looking at, the other report that you're looking at, is um, it includes the re uh, revenue that we collected in February. So it would fall outside of the parameters on that report. Um, we've collected 10.1 million dollars. Uh, in October, November, and December. Um, so the revenue that we collected in February is actually December's collection because the hotels, mm -hmm. as you know, they, you collect them throughout the month, you reconcile them, then you submit them to the tax collector um, by a certain date, and then they run their, they balance everything out and then they send out the report. So we are two months behind as far as revenue um, but the, the difference between what is 
the 6.6 uh, that you were referring to and uh, the report from the tax collector is um, the payment that we received or that was reported uh, in the first week of February. Which, is, which was how much? Uh, it was 3.5 million. In the first week of February, so. Yeah, that, so that would have been December's collection from uh, the hotel guest. Where do we come up with the, you, you have January actual three million seventy one three hundred twenty dollars for total taxes for January action. So that, that can't be true, you're saying, because it hasn't been reported yet. So where is that number coming from and what, what's three million seventy one thousand dollars January actual mean? Um, the actual collection for January would have been three million four hundred and thirty eight thousand dollars after the tax collector fee. Um, so just about three point five million dollars gross. Um, the and then the three point five million in October and the three point one million in can, in November is ten point one million dollars. What excuse me. What what it is is that's what we actually collected in January. It has nothing to do with January. Or very little to do with January, which is what yeah. they collected. And that was probably for November and December. Yeah, that, that would have been collection for so November. So this is cash basis, which for to me is for useless. For <laughs> useless. <laughs> yes. So it it's very confusing it, to follow that. I mean, what's right. what's what's easier to or what's easier to, to digest are the numbers that are on the on this, which are the actual anticipated collections that well, are owed to us. Correct. Those as are opposed those... to what's actually come in. I mean, there's a whole lot more. There's 13 million. Not six million. It makes it look like well, this is really down. Well, but we, yeah, we collected it's thirteen we haven't received million. The cash yet. You yeah. follow what I'm saying? Well, what what was collected in October was three point five million. Yes. What was collected in November was three point one million. What was collected in December was three point five million. Yeah, but when we look at this, it says October through January actuals. That's not the actual. It, six. That's actually what you took in. Correct. It, it's, but it's not actually what's owed to us for those months. So it's very. It's very, in my, in my mind, it was like, this is not very good at all. But now that I, you know, he brings it up, I see, oh, yeah, there's actually 13 million, which is a well, whole lot better. You what follow what I'm saying? What we've my, collected so far in, F, in fiscal year 21 is $10.1 million. Uh, I'm not sure where the 13 million is coming from. You might, and, be, and that's, you might be including the September. No, maybe I can, um, you can clarify. I'm looking at the, the, the tax collector's um, report that shows the gross tax collected at 3.5 and change, but we had to pay the administrative costs. So really we put in our account 3,049 for October. For November, after administrative cost, we put in our account 3,030,000. In December, we put in 3,438,000. Um, the January number I wrote is 3,071, which you said isn't accurate um, because that's some something else collected. So we're going to, to use just for the first three months of the fiscal year, October, November, December, according to the tax collector, that's going to be nine, almost $10 million, which may be that 10 one you're talking about. Correct. But that's for the first three months, not the first four. Correct. Uh, the, the figure that is on the other report, Terry is trying to reconcile what we've spent through the end of January and what we've collected through the end of January. Uh, what the hotels collected is a different number because we receive an, an extra payment in February that is not included in her revenue number. So that's where the, the, the disconnect is, is because we're looking at an extra month of collection on this report, on the tax collector's report, than what is being reported in what Steve just went through. So he, he they, they put a, they cut it off at the end of January. They could have cut it off the first week of February, yeah. but they're, they're just doing a, a monthly I understand report. what it is, so, except with, with one clarification. So the October through January actuals includes all the money that came in, that actually physically came in October through January. Now, if some of the funds came in for September and October, would that be included in that number too? No, they, they anything that was due to us on September 30th, they put it back into into last fiscal year, and that's because okay. of the, the the way that okay. they do so, with the county. So we received six point six million so far for fiscal twenty one uh, in those months October through January, which means based on the tax collector's reports, 
um, of three million plus each month, plus assuming a similar amount for January. That's where he came up with the 13. So we're roughly halfway there in our collections for what actually I mean, is due. I, I, I don't I don't know what what's been been collected for January. We won't get that number until next month. Um, so not I, for January, but through through January 31st, we've collected 6.6 .6 million. Okay, correct. there's a balance due in there, probably of well, another I mean, six million or so. That yeah. it, I think you understand the point from a accrual versus cash. This is cash. It doesn't really match right. revenues and and expenses. It just shows cash coming and going, right? It, as it does, which I mean, which it's, is it's, important to run government. your business to know how much cash right. you have I mean, and where you spend it. But, so we. But, we, they do accounting differently for the government than they do for a business. Yeah. Okay. Well. So. Sorry, I'm used to business. <laughs> anyway, to me, it's kind of it's it's difficult to follow I, I, activities yeah. just looking at when the cash comes and goes. Right. I, I understand, but um, you know the report that they're showing, um, they they pick a, a a cutoff date of the last day of the month. Um, and so they choose yeah. the and, and, January. I mean, they, and that's fine would, now that I know that. Yeah. But I'm yeah. looking at it saying, scratch my head, saying, that doesn't seem very much for the yeah. first quarter. Yeah, we have two reports the, in here that the have budget different of, numbers. You know, the budget of 51 million, 52 million. Right. We're only 6 million there. Well, we're actually double yeah. that. I mean, and that makes a lot more sense. Yeah. So, okay. Thanks. Uh, I mean, again, I think it's it's one thing to kind of see what we're doing against budget. It's another thing to actually see what's going on. And this is confusing to show us what's actually going on. And I think maybe that's part of the challenge here. When you see something like this, it just kind of, you know, initially throws up a lot of red flags when, in truth, we have higher numbers than that. Correct. And also... As everyone knows, it's cyclical, it's cyclical. So you know we're going to get a, we're going to collect a lot more of the budget in March and April and May than we are in October and November. Uh, historically, we uh, over the last ten years uh, we've collected 17.5 percent of our total yearly revenue through December. Right now, we're at 19.4 percent of the budget. So we are uh, we w would appear to be ahead of of a budget in a normal year if, if collection patterns are the same as they have been historically. So that's a number that I look at. I, I don't look at the total collected because it, you know, one month to the next, there's going to be a big difference. You know, we're going to have $10 million potentially in March as we have in previous years. Um, but that doesn't compare to the 3 million that we collected in December. Okay. So that, that's how I look at it is year over year. Okay. Um, I, I just just want to make sure that I'm, is everybody else clear on what's going on or do we need a 101 class in here? I mean, seriously, I'm not being funny about it. If, if we're not clear on what the reports are showing us, I want to make sure we are clear. If we need that, we can ask for it. Um, yes, no, am I seeing? I, I, I think it's the format that that's causing. Yeah. No, it's it's. I'm on. Yeah, he's on. He just has to be one of the first times. I'm. I'm on. He has to be closer. Um, I, I think it's the format, you know, that that there's a real disconnect between where we're actually at, and what's some of the forms and some of the reports that are being put down in front of us. Mm -hmm. I I've been on this council for 16 years. I didn't realize that these expenses were two and two months behind. That I didn't realize that. So. Um, maybe we do need a 101. Okay, and that, or, I mean, we just have to s s suffer per, through it. It's, it's a, you know, it can be a painful process to go through an accounting 101, but I think it might be a good idea, these, these, these deferred expenses and, you know, just when they actually are coming in and how they're being reported, it's almost like, well, let's not even bother with this because it's not telling us the story. Uh, Mayor Bajowski, and then I'll come back to you, Phil. I was just going to say that I think us government folks understand it pretty well because all of our budgets are like that. I think it's the private business owners that are probably struggling with it a little bit more um, because we're used to seeing that lag. We're used to seeing the first couple of months of our property tax all coming in at the same time and only another 15% of our budget being expended at that point. So 
I think we're all used to it. I think maybe they aren't. So yeah. the 101 might help. Yeah. Just just to show just yeah. showing how it actually is coming yeah. in. It, it might be a little might be some clarification. Look, an abridged version, not not, you know, long, but uh, yeah, Phil. I, I would suggest that we look at her other spreadsheet that she says she has for the accrual side. That would make more sense. This is what we committed to spending in October, November, December. This is what we anticipate for revenues based on the tax collector's reports and give us a true matching of revenue and expenses. And, and again, like a business would have, because I think more of us are business people around here than we are government. And that's actually a, a better picture of what's really going on. Uh, to do cash basis, you're always at, you're adjusting your cash basis at the end of the year. So all through the year, that those numbers don't make any sense until you get to the end of the year, and they do their adjustments and they throw the revenues that come in October for September back into September, and they throw those expenses back in there that they spent in October, which were really for September. But they only do that once a year, and frankly, I only do that once a year. But if we're going to look at monthlies and quarterlies or whatever, if she's got a separate spreadsheet, she can present that, which is here's the revenues for a tax collector that's coming in, may not be here yet, and here's the expenses that we've committed, to, that we've already, you know, we've done this program yeah. in this month, and uh, we owe that. I think Move it over to the balance sheet, you know, as a, as a payable. And so I think there's, those yeah, numbers. There's, the numbers tell stories. So I think they're telling two different stories, and I think right. to your point, we could get the other story also. It yeah. wouldn't take that much to see what we're actually seeing. Yeah, I, I know what, she's got it on a spreadsheet, yeah. so if, if that's not too much trouble to present that, yeah. in a regular regular income statement format, then that would show us a whole lot more, I think. So maybe what's maybe a maybe a 101 to, sh to kind of go over what we're seeing here, but then also maybe add a, that other component to it that shows us what's actually going on out there to give us some degree of alarm or like <laughs> we're we're okay, we're not we're 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 doing okay kind of thing. So okay, okay, um, Steve, I think we're. Talking budget timeline next is that? Or are you? Um, yeah, there we go. Uh, yes, I just w wanted to talk budget real quick. In your packet is an actual uh, page that has the timeline for our budget. I wanted to go through that just briefly um, on what we have going forward. We've already started the process for this year. Um, our budgets are due to the county on March 12th. Um, and so uh, working with uh, staff to get all of that pulled together. We have a meeting um, in uh, the, the, um, <coughs> with uh, the county administrator on April 12th to review our budget and then a presentation to the TDC on April 21st. As I mentioned last month, this is moving everything up by a month. So that meeting, we will be uh, utilizing our time to go over the budget for fiscal year uh, 2022. We will get you the information hard copy a week before. Um, um, and then that way you have time to make notes um, to go through and review it and then spend our, our time with presentations from the staff outlining everything that we're looking at doing. In May, we have presentations to the uh, BCC, and then um, our uh, budget is a, a final approval of the county budgets are uh, at the end of September. And of course, we hit the road running on uh, October uh, 1st. So I, I, just, I just wanted to give you guys an idea of, of what we're, we're doing um, so that you knew timeline-wise some of the things that, that are go, uh, going on. So, so we're a month earlier this year than the normal. Yeah, normally in, in the past, uh, well, I mean, last year was different, but in previous years, May was always used as the the, the date uh, to the presentation to the TDC. That's now going to be in April. So I just wanted you guys to be aware of how important that April meeting is. Yes, Mayor? Um, one of the things I uh, wanted to ask, and, and I've been on here two or three years, I guess, what I never see is a time for, for this body to contribute to the goal setting for the year and the strategic planning for the organization for the year. It's, it, it, you all do it and you all have certain goals that you have to set 
that we would have no knowledge of, but it's kind of like the overall discussion of our strategic plan for the year, especially given COVID and all of that, it would just seem like before you kind of burrow in with, with the experts that you have on your team, it would just seem from a policy perspective that we would kind of want to talk a little bit about the strategic direction um, and, and have some input so while you're creating it, there's something for you to be thinking about. I, I just, I don't see that every year we do the budget. It's like we just get presented and you tell us what the goals were and we react to it. And then and sometimes those reactions, I've heard folks like you and, um, and Phil and, and others say, well, but shouldn't we be doing this? So I feel like that should happen ahead of the budget creation process versus after the fact and then trying to change something when it's already kind of been committed to at the team level. So I just throw that out there as something to consider and, and, and it doesn't have to be some big thing given that you've already made your plan here. I'm not trying to throw a monkey wrench, but even if it was at our next meeting or something where we talk, spent a little time talking about it, I just think it's important to get everybody's thoughts before stuff gets put on, put on paper. And I do think we should have some involvement in that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mayor. And I just made a note on that. Uh, one of the items related strategically is during this next nine months, we're going through our strategic plan. So that's even gonna have even higher goals of where we need to be. Um, and that's something I think I talked about too, not the, maybe it was last TDC, but I know the one before that, when we talked about uh, strategically what we're gonna be doing along that line and then getting input from our TDC members in that process. Under the goal part of it, um, let me get with our team and see if that's something that we can briefly present, at least give you an idea of where we're at, the things that we're looking at um, as, as overall organizational goals or uh, focus areas. Um, that helps set the budget and specific things that we want to go through and get done. I think that would be great. At least gives us a chance to have a chat about it. All right. Thank you. Um, as we move from the budget timeline, there was a question regarding pro projection revenues for fiscal year 22. Um, and uh, so I uh, asked Jim, Abernathy with OMB, if he could um, ignite his crystal ball, because my magic eight ball wasn't working um, quite just yet, but to give you an idea of the conversation that we've already had on revenues for 22, based on thoughts and what we're hearing and even projections that we you know hear from industry of what we think will happen with tourism. So, Jim. Uh, okay. Um Okay, so for the, the TDT revenue, for the FY21 budget, as we've discussed, uh, we're just under $52 million. Uh, we're estimating FY21 revenues at $54.7 million, which is um, a slight increase from, uh, from the budget. But um, for, uh, to understand how we do the budgeting, is the number that goes into the budget is 95% of what we actually think we're going to collect, and that's just uh, Florida statute requires us to the budget at 95 percent. So the 54.7 million is actually what we were projecting that we would collect uh, for FY20 for FY21. Um, so it, it's uh, slightly better than budget, but it is uh, right on track from uh, where we thought we were going to be um, for FY22. Uh, again, because of the 95% uh, rule, uh, what we'll put into the budget is a 57.7 million uh, collection, but what will be in the budget is 54.8 million. Um, and that's a 5.4% increase from the, uh, the, from the FY21 estimate uh, at 100%. So the 57.7 million is a 5.4% increase from FY21. Um, how that breaks down, that would be 32.9 million would be in the 60% of the, uh, the 60% portion, 
and 21.9 million it would be the 40 percent which would go towards uh, capital projects or uh, future capital projects. So those are the numbers that we're, uh, that we're starting with for Steve and his team to, uh, to produce their budget. Phil, your revised estimate of the 95% is going to be 54.7 or? Correct. That, that's what we're estimating we'll collect for uh, FY21. And FY22, you're only going up by 100,000? Well, we're going up 5.4% to 57.7 million. Um, that the 95? But budget to budget, we're going from 50, 52 million to 54.8 million. So if you want to compare budget to budget, the 95% oh. to 95%. So the current year is 52 million budgeted. Correct. Budgeted. Correct. And 54 you, million in the coming year. Yep. And That's that correct. They both represent 95% of what you're What we're expecting. expecting. Yes. Yeah, I, I thought you said you just, you just said that the re, that's the budget, but the revised estimate for this year is, what, is the 95 percent mark is 54.7. No, that that's what we don't estimate at 95 percent. Uh, we estimate what we think we're going to get. Oh, okay, so it's 54 and the 95. Okay, correct. The 95 percent <laughs> of of 54.7 million is the 51.9 million in the budget. Got it. Okay, good. We're going up. <laughs> <laughs> Any any other questions? Oh, Chuck, sorry, you, Mr. Chair. Um, first, Jim, thanks. Um, I'm still amazed at uh, last year when you took and revised downward because of COVID the budget, and um, you did great in your team. Uh, this year in 2021, it looks like you're going to do very well also, so I can only assume your crystal ball uh, is a pretty good one for 2022, so thank you. Um, you mentioned when you were up here a minute ago um, the cyclical nature of the monthly incomes. Um, and hopefully we've looked at the, the biggest, um, most painful hit to our budget. We're a cyclical market. So um, our season, January, February, March, April, um, certainly half of March last year was affected by COVID and April was. But January and February were full non-COVID. And um, if you look, once again, at your numbers, your, your January should be 45% off in revenue if, if it's somewhere going to be in that world. It's, it's going to be a lot um, in February even more. So I just uh, hopefully we've added those, oh, my goodness, two months in our Yes. When we set the budget for FY21, we, we excluded the COVID hit when we were looking at projections. And then we added a COVID discount. And what we did is we discounted what we thought you should have been at for January by 50%. So we already factored that into the, um, to the, the budget itself. Okay. So when, when we looked at the, the total budget, the January piece of that is 50% of what it would have been it's in a non-COVID right. time. 50%, yeah. So, okay. Um, well, thank you very much. And then the, the other months are at 80, or, January, February, and March are at 50% of what would have been. Yes. Um, and the other months, I believe, were 85% okay. of normal. So, so we did anticipate a recovery um, back to some normal, but not full recovery. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, Jim. Okay. Thank you, Jim. All right, uh, department updates. And if I could have Katie Bridges come up, talk about spring safety campaign. And we gave you a little bit of a, a look at what we were doing, but more of that has been finalized. And this is as we come into our spring busy season of, of again, conveying that message to the visitor of, a, of a, how we are a safe, a safe destination. So Katie, take it away. Thank you. So as Steve mentioned, um, I believe last month, Leroy gave kind of an update, um, reminder of what we're our advertising that we're running, that we've been running since November in the markets. Um, and just want to touch base on some um, a promotional effort that we're doing for spring. 
Um, so, um, so the goals for spring really are to encourage those that we've inspired to visit, um, to have a safe, enjoyable experience. Uh, we want to continue to be their up-to-date source of information on visit stpclearwater.com. We still maintain um, a banner on the top of our website with uh, information for updates for visitors looking to travel. Um, we want to work with the cities and the municipalities um, to help provide resources um, and suggestions for things to help manage, um, hopefully, some um, uh, crowds here this uh, March. Um, and then we've also updated some of our Rise to Shine safety materials um, and some resources for businesses. So um, one thing is our planning pre-travel. So in those markets that we're advertising in, we're also adding some added value radio and TV, and then also doing some social promotion in those markets to help remind them about um, you know, visiting safely. And then while they're in market, I'm um, working with our brand ambassador teams um, to develop a street team to uh, surprise and delight those visitors um, for enjoying the destination safely um, and doing some social um, promotion along with that. So our um, pre-planning is our ultimate beach day getaway. And so we launched this on January 25th in connection with the National Travel um, plan, National Plan Your Vacation Day that US Travel puts on. Um, and we're running it through April 30th. It's, it's a, a Rise to Shine pledge. And by taking this pledge to spread out, mask up, um, wash your hands, be patient and kind, um, you'll be entered to a sweepstakes for the ultimate beach day getaway. And so it's a four night stay here in the destination. And then we'll also put together a private cabana for the lucky winner, fully stocked with um, you know, all the necessities for their, their beach day. And so all of that is at ultimatebeachday.com. We're promoting that in our radio social broadcast. So you'll see here, um, let me see. This is our TV spot, um, a 10 second teaser, um, win an unforgettable getaway. Um, and there's audio on this, but enter to win at ultimatebeachday.com. So this is running in conjunction with our normal advertising and our spots in those markets that we have TV running. And here's the, if you go to ultimatebeachday.com, you'll see the information on the Rise to Shine pledge. So, you know, reminding um, people to, you know, share your support for being safe and courteous um, and enter the pledge um, and you'll be entered to win to this, in the sweepstakes. And so off to a great start um, the first three weeks and we're just today starting those TV spots. Um, so it'll really pick up starting now, but just in the first three weeks, we've already had 16,138 take the pledge and great response with 77% also signing up for our e-newsletter. So that is awesome. They're definitely interested in the destination and uh, we look forward to communicating with them in the future. And like I mentioned, we still have the Visit Responsibly banner on the top of our website. Um, we've changed the language, um, mask up, spread out, have fun. More tips for visiting responsibly inside. And we have, you know, keep updated on the travel tips, the county ordinance for uh, mask requirement, and we'll keep that updated as necessary. The second part is our in-market promotion. So this is um, starting end of next week. Um, our uh, brand ambassador teams are transitioning into our Sunshine Steward Street teams. And they'll be located at popular spots across the county, um, looking out for people that are doing the right things, um, wearing their mask, um, spacing out when they're in line, drawing circles on the beach, um, doing things um, that is responsible behaviors. Um, and so they'll be keeping an eye on, on them and then rewarding them with a gift card that they can spend in destination at businesses. We have a, a website QR code there that has businesses um, and information about that they can click and, and go to. Um, and then also working with them with our street ambassador teams to um, create some social moments with these. And then we're also promoting this heavily on P uh, with our PR efforts. And we already received a really big win um, with the New York Times. They had reached out to our PR agency about what we're doing here um, for spring break and spring travel. Um, and so, you know, we have a quote here in the third paragraph and then a beautiful image um, promoting, you know, that, um, but our Sunshine Stewart treat, Street teams and how we'll be um, uh, handing out gift cards to to visit to people that are here uh, traveling and, and doing the right things. So we can uh, hope to get more PR out of that messaging. 
And then we have a webinar scheduled for tomorrow um, at 3 p.m. with our uh, local industry. Um, and we'll have, um, I believe someone from the Sheriff's Department will be on the call um, to update on the, the you know, businesses and what they can continue to do um, as, you know, hopefully, you know, we get, get some more travelers back in destination. Just kind of those reminders um, um, about, you know, the ordinance, but also we want to talk to them about, um, you know, continue to use those creative, you know, ways that they've been doing in the past year to emphasize distancing and mask wearing, um, help spread the word about um, our initiatives, pre-travel and, and in market, um, what, however possible, um, prepare and educate your employees, um, and other reminders and tips. Um, and then we've updated some resources here. So at visitspc.com slash toolkit, we've provided some um, updated handout flyers, signage posters um, that businesses can go in and download. Um, and they can add their custom logo and, and put it in a variety of um, signage. And I'll show you that in a second. And then we still are um, providing free materials. Um, and businesses can go to visitspc.com slash rise to shine and order printed posters, face mask buttons, windows table clings. Here's an example of um, the toolkit page. Um, so we have a couple different signs um, that have the, the elements of our pledge on there. The mask up, spread out, wash your hands, be patient and kind. Um, here's an example of like a poster size. And we also have a customizable eight and a half by 11 flyer. So this is great for uh, anyone that's checking into a hotel or whatever, just to kind of give them an update on what's happening here in the destination. And like in that top left box, um, a business can add their own personal logo there. So, you know, the signage can be done, you know, printed out for on a desk, on, the, on a window, um, in yard signs, or even here on the bottom right uh, for the beach. And then what I also mentioned, yeah, we have the visitsbc.com slash rise to shine where part, partners and businesses can still go on and request materials and we will um, package them up and deliver it to them. So that's just a brief update there just to keep you informed on what we are doing um, for our spring to help with spring travel. Yes, I may. Yeah, Russ. Um, I've had a couple uh, emails uh, in Clearwater, and um, Steve did a presentation a couple weeks ago and brought up some of these items, and we hear about it. How we communicated to the police departments and to the to those that convey back to the the cop that's on the beat or on the beach, and what about the sheriff? What's he doing so that we know that communication is there? There's Hoteliers are worried about that shot on CNN of too busy of a beach. And I know we've had some discussions, but where is that actual happened uh, in the communities? Yeah, so yeah, I know Steve's met with the city managers um, to kind of coordinate those efforts. And we hope that we can get a good turnout tomorrow for the webinar um, to really also show the kind of with our sheriff on the call um, to help reiterate that yes, we do not want to be the CNN um, headline story. Um, and so these are some of the things that we can do um, and to help combat that with our PR work that we're doing to kind of communicate, you know, we are doing these things um, to help kind of mitigate any of that. Is there a way to communicate between now and tomorrow or in the next week to make sure that the different municipality police departments have this information and everything um, as we go. I think it's so critical this is um, on it. And, and I, just to say there's one for the industry tomorrow at a certain time, um, I think we've got to go a little deeper to say, okay, St. Petersburg Police Chief Tony Holloway, you got two beaches or whatever it is, Here's the programs and here's the signage and what would you like and what can we do and, and all to help back you up. I, I just think that it's so necessary in the next two weeks. Yes, Mayor. I'll get back to you in a second. Yeah, uh, just to follow up to that, I mean, I, I will tell you that we are, we are obviously taking it and have been taking it very seriously. Um, if anything, I get criticized for coming down too hard on some businesses because they're not following the rules but we don't want those images either and we know the impact it has on all of our hoteliers um, i just want to compliment you on the 
information that you're you're making available to hoteliers in particular in addition to everyone else but having just been out of town this weekend uh, to an area um, of the state where when we checked into our hotel we had no idea what the rules were in that community uh, when we were trying to go out to dinner I mean I'm calling restaurants up just to ask them what are they doing because we had no idea and and quite frankly, didn't see much compliance at all in that community. I won't throw them under the bus by naming where it was. I'll just say it was north of here. Uh, but I, I greatly appreciate it, I think, for our visitors and guests that come to our area, knowing what the rules are makes it a lot easier and makes them more comfortable. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor Michalski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So just to follow up on everything that's just been said, um, I get, you know, I'm going to look at to you, Commissioner Eggers, because, um, you know, City of Dunedin has the sheriff. But I, I guess my question is, is, are we going to maybe put some enforcement out on the beaches, in case this happens? Um, and that's really not Info on this board. In case, in case this, what's this? Spring crazy, spring break craziness. Oh, okay. And having those shots. In the news, I mean, the only way to stop that really is to, I mean, unless they don't come and we don't know that the, whether they're coming or not, but if they do, there's got to be some enforcement, yeah. you right. know, on the beach that, that ensures, it, you know, because there has to be a presence and I think a presence of law enforcement deters whether you say anything or don't say anything. Um, I do think the presence detours some of that action. Um, that's what I really think needs to be worked through because I know there's different models of thinking about that in our own county in different police departments. So I think it has to be consistent. Yeah, well, th yeah, I know, and I know that that conversation is, has been occurring more so in the our emergency planning group meetings uh, that we have every Tuesday, but um, sheriffs on all of them. And he's in touch with the the different police groups that we have, you know, the different cities that have police groups, especially, you know, I think about Clearwater, St. Pete, and their presence out on the beaches is, is, is critical. Um, you know, I don't, I really, you know, when you look back on last year and you think uh, the, there was there was a lot of beach activity and we tried to spread that out a little bit, but the, the, the bigger concerns were what was going on at nights. You know, it's like, you know, you, back to the hotels and what are, what are the hotels doing and then they go out to dinner what are the restaurants doing and then they go out to nightclubs and what are the nightclubs doing to try to bring some normalcy because all of that to your point about we don't want to see it on national pictures it doesn't take too many shots at night to see people jammed in together without masks that supersede anything that could be going on at the beaches I mean but I think to your point, we are, you know, I think we're going to have to be watching that really carefully. I don't think there's been a real interest from the, from, you know, to, to do a lot of, you know, ticketing enforcement, but certainly enforcing the rules that we have, I think, is in play for sure. Yes, Russ. Um, I think a lot of it's being done by the municipalities already, and I think it's our obligation to let them know what we're trying to do and everything, and I think that's part of it, what's happening is, I know Clearwater has X number of police every year come from this state to this state to increase for safety on the beach and all that, and awareness. Now, I think it's our obligation to help take it directly to them, saying, here's what we're doing with the tourists, and, and everything, too, is a piece. I know also that I have two restaurants that, uh, small restaurants on Up County that we support, um, both of them, have had visit by the sheriff's department on do they comply with masks, do they comply with distancing and all those things. So they're out there doing it to the establishments and everything too. And, and in Clearwater, I know they're, they're working on the nightlife and so forth. I just want to make sure as the TDC, we're giving that information that they, we can get signage to them or whatever it is to make sure yeah. in, in a timely manner. Yeah. And I think more and more people are realizing that the, the safer that we show ourselves to be, the more people that will have confidence in yep. coming. I mean, it, you know, in the beginning it was, you know, there were some of the other feelings. It's like, 
we, you yeah. know, we're hurting our business. But I think in truth, I think most people understand now that you know you're really trying to bring that business back slowly, and that and that means bring, breeding confidence to visitors that are coming or considering our area. Phil, um, yeah, there's a question of how many spring breakers from out of town we'll have, but the high schoolers are still going to be out there. You know, so the regional population is still going to go to the beach in March. <laughs> And so I think it's point well taken that we really need to make sure that there are rules and that they uh, are being enforced as best as possible because we'll get that flyover, it'll be on national news, and then that'll, that'll definitely hurt. Um, so it's definitely a concern whether, whether out-of-towners come in what numbers, we don't know, but the local population always goes out there, and they'll be out there again this spring. Yeah, I haven't heard any cancellation of spring break. Uh, for the local schools, so I mean, I assume we'll have that in sometime in late March, probably a week or two. Certainly, there's run two or three weeks between the counties that are right around here, but they, it probably extends all the way over to Polk County too. So people coming, coming over. So that's a great point. Uh, thank you, Phil. Thank you, Mayor Bajalski. We'll make sure we get that going. Anything else? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Uh, and I appreciate everyone your uh, patience today as we run through a, a lot um, as we head into um, a busy time, busy time of the year. Next up, I've got Leroy coming to talk a little bit about Super Bowl and just a, a quick recap and a preliminary recap of what, what we saw here in Pinellas County. Thank you again. And uh, just a real quick, uh, one of the the a great product of going through COVID has been our increased relationship with Pinellas County Marketing Communications, Barbara Hernandez and her team. And they have done an incredible job of mobilizing a regional PIO network, public information officer network. We participate as VSPC in weekly calls with marketing communications, every municipality in Pinellas County, Department of Health, uh, multiple fire and police units uh, in Pinellas County and Hillsborough County. And so we have uh, last week we did share the upcoming webinar with that group there is another call today that i'll be on i will make sure that uh, we, we remind them about the webinar and then distribute that same presentation and the toolkit link to that group it's an incredible group and, and kudos to, to barbara's team for activating that during COVID, and something i'm looking forward to continuing after so um super bowl we're gonna start with some of the more important pieces here, and that is truly just the economic performance around Super Bowl. Obviously, it's gonna take us a bit more time to get all of the nitty gritty, but this is what STR hotel performance looked like Friday before the game, Saturday before the game, and, and Sunday. I've got TBD, we just received that um, during the meeting this morning. I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. Um, you can see from a, a rate perspective, the highest uh, rates the destination has seen uh, two of the highest rates since the pandemic began. And again, this is Pinellas County wide uh, information. And keep in mind, February was pre COVID, right? So these are, these are some pretty, what in, in my opinion, let me editorialize a little bit, some pretty strong occupancy numbers given COVID. Are they normal Super Bowl numbers? No. And I don't think anybody expected that. However, uh, some pretty successful numbers. Sunday, the seventh checked in at 75.2% occupancy which is 7% higher year over year. So Sunday did outperform uh, 2019. And the ADR for Sunday was 193.56, which is 25% higher a uh, year over year. So Sunday continued that positive trend. And real, one real quick note, not Super Bowl related, but as we look forward to the rest of that STR report, last Saturday, new hoteliers will beat me to this punch. President's weekend was massive. 90% occupancy across the county last Saturday. Uh, pretty incredible number given the circumstances that we're still operating in. On the vacation rental side, so STR hotels on the vacation rental, um, incredible performance still. And when you look at the week, the full week of occupancy in vacation rentals, the highest occupancy week since, uh, since early March. So at least uh, some of those early returns and, and Steve put this chart together actually comparing not just against 2019, but against our other COVID weekends, right? So again, it's hard to compare against 2019 truly because of the circumstances we're in. So this is, you know, Super Bowl weekend, 
the, the prior 90 days uh, uh, for the weekends, um, or sorry, prior 90 days, their averages of where they're running at, and then the difference for Super Bowl. So again, is it, is it your normal economic impact for a Super Bowl? No, but I think as, as Steve said throughout a lot of media interviews, it's better than nothing. And this, this chart right here uh, certainly proves that economic boost that the Super Bowl brought uh, across the board for STR, the top two, and vacation rentals. The next a piece is a video. Um, it's quite long. I will be honest, at this point, I did not expect this to be two and a half hours plus into this meeting. This is an eight plus minute video. We're not gonna share the whole thing. It is really powerful. Uh, if we would, I'm gonna scroll to it. Keep some of the audio a uh, medium level. I'm gonna talk over some of it. We'll cut it short, but we'll make sure that uh, we get this out to you all. We wanted to capture visually a lot of what our teams did throughout the Super Bowl. This is our consumer activation space that Craig and his team executed at Tech Village as part of the Super Bowl experience, um, engaging with, and, and, and with, with consumers. Important to note, this actually wasn't a ticketed, you had to have the app, but this wasn't part of the, like, the reserved space. So this was open, truly open to the public um, and, and a, a significant presence over there at the Super Bowl experience. The 21st Annual Celebrity Flag Football Challenge is presented by Visit St. Pete Clearwater. So this was the, the flag football, celebrity flag football event that took place on Clearwater Beach the Saturday before the Super Bowl. Um, you can see a lot of the signage in the background, um, uh, America's Best Beaches signage, obviously taking place out there at Clearwater Beach. Uh, this aired live on ESPN News and is airing taped um, on Fox Sports Florida and uh, well, you're Fox enjoying Sun. today's 21st annual celebrity flag football game presented by Visit St. Pete Clearwater. Let's send you out to the beach. We're hanging out at St. Pete Beach. It's about 35 miles from where Susie was over at Raymond James. This is ESPN, and, uh, the day, the day of the game. Set. It's the beach set, the party set, something like that. Getting ready for Super Bowl 55, hanging out with a few of my closest friends, Red Trade Ryan, wins never look Randy better. Moss, Sam. here on ESPN. <laughs> and there are some beautiful beaches in this area. In fact, we're on a beach right now. You'll see us in seconds. If you don't believe me, you're about to find out. That's actually the back of our set. Welcome to NFL Live, everybody. We are so happy to be with you. So these are just a couple of the beach. ESPN Listen, clips man, we dropped in here. We're on the beach. They we're started here. broadcasting okay. from Trade Winds on Thursday through down. Sunday. Right here from St. We've Pete got some uh, uh, media value that we've we've attributed this. I will tell you, I think it's truly hard to tell just how valuable that was. The bumpers in and out of uh, the ESPN coverage. This is the media center. This is where uh, I spent pretty much the whole week, and, and Steve spent a lot of time there as well. This is at the Tampa Convention Center. Media would pick up their credentials, come through, engage with our booth that was shared with Visit Tampa Bay and the Super Bowl host committee. We had areas uh, to pick up information, uh, uh, just shy of uh, 500 gift cards given out to local or to media who picked up their information. We also had a digital set here for Steve to do interviews, Zoom interviews. This particular interview is with The Telegraph in the UK. Um, you know, one of the huge opportunities with hosting a Super Bowl in Tampa Bay is squeezing as Cuban much media exposure out of it as possible. That brings up a lot of conversation. Of who this does is a the segment we secured from. on behalf now, of Bodega. Tell cheese fans I who get are it. Here the to Tampa that the you lower third says Tampa. The Cuban sandwich. Now they say if you don't, it's the equivalent of going to Kansas City and not trying the barbecue. Beach resorts and hotels here in Pinellas County are hoping that even with the Bucks playing at home and a limited number of fans at the Super Bowl. So I'm going to I'm going to move on. The the video it, it, it includes a ton more media coverage, in particular um, an interview with Chris Johnson from Green Bench Brewery that aired in D.C. Um, Nick's pick Clearwater Marine Aquarium. We pitched this. Uh, uh, cannot credit our New York City PR firm NJF enough. Uh, Alyssa was kind of caught in some of those videos there at our, at our media center. She was on site with Steve, with myself, driving media to talk about St. Pete Clearwater at every turn as much as possible. These are, these are the, the, the media coverage by numbers. Uh, these are some large numbers. And one of the big reasons why is Nick's pick, and I kind of mentioned it. Um, Nicholas the Dolphin at Clearwater Marine Aquarium has done Super Bowl picks or big game picks before. Um, <laughs> We, we, we hit the right spot this year. Not only, obviously, hosting the game, the Bucks in the game, uh, and then Nick picked the Chiefs, 
This created a ton of interest on this story. We pitched it out. It made Good Morning America, CNBC, every national show out there talking about Clearwater, talking about the aquarium, Nick's story, and the destination. Massive numbers, yes, more than one billion impressions, a ridiculous amount of ad equivalency. And this map, I know you can't necessarily read all the cities. They, th this represents where media coverage landed that we were responsible for. It's not just happenstance that, that it hit there. So a lot of the coverage was picked up and syndicated. Outlets across the country were interested in creating Super Bowl content, and we helped do that uh, in many ways on broadcast. I wanted to share some of the non-broadcast pieces visually as well, um, and I would encourage anybody to go back and watch the full-length uh, recap video. This is a piece Condé Nast Traveler dropped the, the leading into the Super Bowl. I get it. It says Tampa. What our job is is to make sure when people are thinking and talking Tampa, they see and think about St. Pete Clearwater. And so here's a very good example. We all know Dolly's not in Tampa, but we're, we're getting the destination inserted into these conversations, obviously uh, talking about uh, Fort DeSoto Park, it's Dog Beach, even mentioning the Don Cesar down there in, in places to stay. Yahoo News working with these writers to make sure they're including aspects of our destination when they're talking about the Super Bowl and the Super Bowl coverage, things to do. We've got Innisbrook, a great collection of places around the destination here. USA Today, uh, putting forth Clearwater Beach and the St. Pete Pier as five famous places for outdoor fun. The New York Times, Steve, Steve's becoming a regular in the New York Times. Um, uh, hopefully he doesn't expect that for too, too much longer. Uh, that's not normal. Uh, frankly, but he, he, again, quoted in this story, and I know Santiago, we love Santiago Visit Tampa Bay. He was not quoted, uh, as Steve was. And, and again, that, the, the, these, it's a result of the efforts put forth by our, our NJF PR firm and, and, and the work of having them here for it. Uh, Forbes as well. Um, and actually, let me go back to this piece. I highlighted the part that I really like. Again, our job is you know, when you, when you hear Tampa and Tampa Bay and Tampa constantly, we want to make sure that media is telling the story of that, that St. Pete Clearwater makes up that region too. So I love the part here that talks about it's a body. It really explains it nicely because a lot of people don't un understand how com complex our region is. Uh, Forbes, um, again, highlighting our, our beer scene. And this is just some of the non-broadcast uh, uh, coverage from Nick that uh, was, a, was a product of our work. I mentioned the broadcast exposure um, from ESPN, the Celebrity Sweat Game. There's a, an estimated combined media value uh, there of uh, more than $186,000. Again, some of that stuff is truly hard to quantify, but um, you know, BVK, our agency, does its, the, the best job it can, and, and it, you know, to a certain degree, some priceless footage uh, throughout that day. I am going to uh, hit some of this briefly. Aaron. Aaron's group, one of the beauties of working with destination analysts is they're doing that ongoing COVID research. So we can insert questions at any point in time to get a gauge on what that audience is thinking and feeling, whether it's COVID related or not. So we had them input some Super Bowl related questions into their weekly survey. So this is from 1,200 plus people. You know, did you watch the game? Okay, uh, a, a little bit more than half. Um, at any point during the game, do you recall uh, seeing any images or stories about the area recall. So helping us understand what recall is as it relates to the Super Bowl and benefiting us. And then recalling not just Tampa, but St. Pete Clearwater, which again is helpful for the spotlight. And then this is, th these are a couple that, that I was particularly interested in. Impact on us specifically. Did, did it affect your interest in us? And a large majority of these people are saying, yes, it did impact us, and, and that's a good thing. More interested, 88% of the people more interested uh, for those who said it impacted them in, in, uh, in St. Pete Clearwater. So just, again, some data that can point to um, how the Super Bowl, you know, what it did for our region and our area. I'm gonna buzz through this, and I apologize. Some of this data can get complex, and uh, it's really powerful. I mentioned Arrivalist earlier. This is cell phone movement data. So we're able to use smartphones really quickly within two weeks of the game to understand where people are coming from and what they're doing while they're here for the Super Bowl. And it helps us understand that impact, right, and what it's worth. So again, anonymized uh, uh, smartphone data as well as some uh, drive data that I'm gonna share. So who showed up for the game and then spent time 
um, in Pinellas County. Here are the top 10 markets. This is the week of the Super Bowl. And you'll see, so, okay, Tom Brady went to Michigan. Looks like a bunch of Michigan Wolverine fans showed up uh, for the Super Bowl and then in Pinellas County as well. And we compared that against 2019, uh, sorry, 2020 data, and that's not quite true. On the left side is this year, on the right side is last year. You see Michigan was number two last year too. So uh, what this tells us to a certain degree is uh, the Super Bowl didn't necessarily change the uh, rival market a ton in terms of, uh, of where they were coming from. You can see uh, North Carolina and Wisconsin dropped out, Missouri, shocker, right? The Chiefs actually entered the top 10 on the left side. So again, trying to understand that impact, okay, there, there is real impact there. Um, and many of the other markets fairly consistent. Fly versus drive. An important question uh, for us right now and, and trying to understand how these people got here, how far they drove. Uh, almost eight in 10 did drive uh, for, to the area around the time of the Super Bowl. How does that compare, again, versus last year? It is skewing, as we would expect, as the data shows, as we know, because of COVID, more people are driving than flying. And so a good comparison year over year. Uh, origin markets and, the, and road trips. And so one of the things Arrivalist has been doing more than ever during COVID is drilling into road trip travel uh, because it's making up such a large percentage. So these, these are the markets that um, drove the most. Uh, to, to our area for the Super Bowl, and you can see the percentages of overnight. Obviously, the farther from where they come, the more likely it is they stay overnight and the longer their trip is. Um, this is um, not, not th this is including all markets, including in-state, and you can see even something like an Atlanta and a Chicago breaking the top 10 um, against those in-state. In so again, road trip arrivals, the percentage likelihood. Orlando pops with all of our data. What's special about Orlando is to see, di despite its proximity, still 61% of them are staying overnight. That, that's, that's good to see. Um, as we look at airports and, and those who have flown into the destination, this is uh, those who hit either St. Pete Clearwater or Tampa International. You can see the top markets there, Kansas City, uh, popping up and appearing in this data. Um, one other one that I like, and I'm almost done here, I promise, is uh, the POI. So you can see by day, the points of interest, February 7th, that purple spike, that's Raymond James, okay? Those people who actually went to Raymond James and um, spent time in Pinellas County. What else were they doing? You can see downtown Tampa was high, so was St. Petersburg. Pier 60, you know, we've got a number of different um, uh, POIs there. So we can start to break down this data and understand their movement within the destination. Okay, they didn't just go to the game. They also went downtown. They stayed on the beach and understanding that, that economic impact. So um, a pretty crowded executive summary slide. Obviously, this is posted on the partner site, and we're going to continue to dig into the data and information as we get it. A sprint there. Thank you for your time. Yeah. Thanks, Leroy. Any, any questions? Thanks. Appreciate it. Great. Right. Thank, th uh, thank you, Leroy. And we're coming into the home stretch here. Uh, if I could have Tim Ramsberger come up and just briefly go over timeline for our fiscal year 2022 elite events processing guidelines. Uh, good morning. I think it's still morning. Yes, good morning. In your packet is a one sheet uh, timeline that is consistent with what we've done in the past in terms of the process for going forward with the funding program. And as Steve pointed out earlier, with regard to the budgeting process, now that that's moved early in April, I think this will align nicely with uh, allowing for us some time with this body to meet uh, in May and June to discuss the elite event program. But if, if this timeline is uh, acceptable uh, to this group and, and you, Chairman Eggers, the posting of all the materials, we've gone digital the last few years, so that makes it a lot easier for us. So we'll post everything in about 30 days, all the applications uh, and information that's necessary. Uh, it'll open up April 1st, it'll close on April 30th. Uh, so a good solid month of uh, timeline for, for applicants. And then there will be a committee review, and again, uh, that'll be established at some point of who's serving on the committee. Uh, that is an appointment that uh, uh, the commissioner will make. 
and we'll establish when that review meeting will take place. And then hopefully, if they, we're in keeping with this schedule and the sequencing here, it'll, the, the recommendations of the review committee will come forward to the full TDC uh, consideration and, and that will then be advanced to the Board of County Commission for final approval in July. What happens after that is these are up to funding amount uh, approvals and therefore after the Board of County Commission approves your recommendations, we as staff, uh, as we have done in the past, will then set up meetings with these individual event organizers. We'll go through their application and essentially negotiate the deal terms that then go to contract and those eventually come back for Board of County Commission approval. So we've built some, some time here to allow for us to meet in the months of August and September as this is an October 1st uh, uh, fiscal for the uh, elite event funding. So this is what we've uh, set out as the timeline and welcome any comments or questions. May I? Yeah, uh, Commissioner Bajowski. Hi, Tim. Uh, I was part of the subcommittee last year and I just remember, and this isn't to do with the timeline at all, it's just to do with the information that the newly appointed committee will be looking at what I had felt we were missing that you provided to us like kind of late in the game was the return on investment of the previous of any of the existing events that had happened previously. You had given us some additional um, information. I'm just hoping that that's going to be included in for consideration in the, in the new year of If that's what this body wants, then we can certainly supply that, sir. Because it, you get an application this thick and and you don't get any indication on the past performance of the events. And so you're trying to decide whether to continue to do it or not. And there's no past performance return on investment numbers. And, and as a decision maker, I, I probably won't be this year, but as I was last year, it was extremely difficult to look at that and try to determine. I just think it's a number that we should absolutely have if we're going to be um, That's fine. We... Fun, helping to fund them. Thank you. Welcome. Mr. Chair. Yeah, yes. Uh, two questions, if I could, uh, Tim. Uh, could we be looking at a, a update on the last time that we, we did uh, appropriate and fund, and then you went through negotiations with each of these? How much did we actually spend? And, and some of that were canceled and so forth, that maybe in another meeting or something, we can kind of a update on this to know where we are and what's happened and where we go forward um, in t for 22. The other one is category three, where it has the requirements of uh, unique paid and, and room nights in category one, two, and three, and four. Um, should that be reviewed at some point uh, under the circumstances we are now for the year 22? Yeah, again, from a staff's perspective, that is up to this board to decide what you want these guidelines to be and reflect. And so we're here to help accomplish that if that's what you want. And maybe you could come back to us with the update with also recommendations on that category, what you're thinking, seeing that you've been through this numerous times. Be glad to. Yeah, and we probably uh, sooner rather than later on, yeah. on that because we're, I mean, we're already getting there pretty quickly on time, so. Um, any others? Yes, Mayor Krishna. Thank you. Just to follow up on something Russ said, I think it would be really beneficial for uh, this body to see what was the amount that uh, had been approved by this body and then ultimately by the, <clears throat> the county commission versus what was actually provided uh, to the event. Um, I know I've, we've talked about this before, and I, I think I, I expressed it when I first got back on this body is that I had some concerns about the up to awards and how events kind of are, they come, they make a presentation, they feel like they they put their dog and pony show on several times, get an amount that they believe they're getting and then ultimately what they end up getting isn't anything necessarily in that same range. So I'd be really interested to see how close those amounts were. Um, and uh, as far as the selection of that of that group that takes a look at it, uh, do I like ask for folks that might be interested to let let you know? Um, 
I'd like to see that from from the group here. Anybody who might be interested in sitting on that subcommittee, let's let Steve know, and then we'll we'll get back we'll get back to the group. Um, anything else? Any other questions? I think just one thing to note administratively, if we're going to change the guidelines, and I think Michael Zoss can weigh in here, that requires approval from the Board of County Commissioners, so that might delay this timeline if that's what we're going to be doing. And I just put that out there as a word of caution okay. relative to the timeline, that's all. Yeah, we have that discussion. I guess we'll, we'll weigh that, you know, delay versus making the changes. Yes, Phil. I think it's probably too late for this year to make any significant changes to it based on your timeline we set up here. Yeah. But I, we've talked about this in the past, and <clears throat> I'll refresh everybody's memory that just take category two, um, 10,000 room night requirement at an average of about $9 per room in bed tax. That means we're asking them for a $90,000 return on a $75,000 investment. And I know that some entities may skew their numbers a little bit, so we're fighting back that way. But it just still seems that I don't think we expect anything to have over 100% return on investment. Um, <clears throat> and we're trying to help out organizations. We have, we have never spent what was originally budgeted. We've got uh, gotten up to a million and a half or more in a budget, and we've never come close to spending it all. Um, there may be some other organizations out there that don't apply because they feel like they can't provide these um, these numbers. And if we lighten it up a little bit to help more events out, um, then we might be spending that budget and we might benefit more overall. So, but I, I don't think that as it requires uh, BCC approval, I think it's something that we should put on the agenda for next year's guidelines to be changed or to look at them at least and, and solidify them again um, and have a you know meaningful discussion about it. In, in a timely fashion that gives Tim plenty of time to put everything together and, and get it out to people. So this year, this is already out, I assume. No, we will we'll post this if the consensus of this body is that this is a timeline you want to operate under, then we can post it in 30 days. You can post it in 30 days, but... The we want to open up the application process April 1st, so we want to give applicants enough time to look at the information online and be familiar with it, and then we would open it up for uh, the month of April, close it April 30th, and then we would go forward with the review process. As I said, I... I well, maybe there is time to make changes. I don't know. You tell me. Well, and, and again, that in discussion, the discussion with staff, keep in mind last year, when did we actually... We didn't decide anything until July, correct? We were late. Be yeah. Everything got delayed. But we still... Everything still got processed. We did. So, and we're still in the middle of that, obviously, with certain events that are yeah. going on now. So I, I think we have some room for discussion that, you know, hey, if there's something we really feel strongly about as a body that we want to change, then let's look at doing that. Okay. You, know, if, you know, if it's a wholesale change, maybe it's one of those, okay, let's put it on the list to discuss next year, move this process up about a couple of months, and then say we look at, you know, bigger changes from there. So. Uh, I, I think we've got leeway to, I think we've got some wiggle room. And this uh, timeline, there needs to be approved next meeting if we're going to stick to this timeline, I mean, to get it out. Right? Uh, essentially, if, it, yeah, yes, sir. My, then, then I think it's so important to have the update and also recommendation from staff if there is any changes before we vote on the schedule, yeah. as you're saying. Yeah. Just a real quick question on direction for that update. You would like to visit all categories, just one category? I'm not sure how, again, this is a, a debate that obviously you all would have in terms of what, what you want to set about. the thresholds to be. And what your recommendations are from your experience in the last couple of years. For example, uh, this year I believe Valspar is at 10,000 a day instead of 30,000. We don't know the next year, so they wouldn't necessarily meet it or not the numbers, yet it's a very valuable, just like we went through Super Bowl. So we need to say in that, that should be changed to this number, or maybe it should be changed permanently. I don't know. And I think, uh, you know, the mayor brought up saying the, the, the update for the value, if we funded $100,000, what did that organization get? A recap a year later, or whatever it is, to get an idea of where we are spending from that. 
That's why well, I think it's well, important yeah, yeah. first. Yeah, and hopefully, yeah. Do, do you uh, do you, do you get the direction? Yeah, we can, we can provide a history okay. of the last five years or so of funding for all yeah, those. Yeah, what we sure. told them they might up to get and what they actually got. Correct. Yeah, Mayor. I was just going to say that. Um, uh, I agree with what you were saying, except I don't think we should wait. I think everything you said was perfect because, look, our events in this region, in this county, are not going to be the same for probably two or three years until we, as you heard about the traveling, it's going to take some time to bounce back. And if there's anything we can do right now to help these events come online, um, they still have to be evaluated. They have to be valuable. But we are having a drive-in market, and to keep that going until fly-in happens, um, I, I absolutely think that the number of hotel rooms should be evaluated um, in the COVID mindset, not, not forever. Um, because I think this is the one thing we can do is to help these people continue on, especially with these events that we've had. Um, I think it's it's valuable. Just like I, got, I said earlier today, I'm going to have spring training in my city with only a thousand fans, but I can't tell you how excited my businesses are because of that. And I guarantee you, Clearwater feels the same. Um, and so while it's not 9,000 fans, it's something. And so I, I kind of look at these events the same way. So for me, I would want you all to collectively, as the, the team experts, to, to say what could be the right COVID number and bring that back to us next month and ask the, commission, ask the county commission if they would temporarily or even go to them before you come back to us. I don't think we know what the right number is. Yeah. I just think there's a diff, there, we have to be able to say there's a flexible number. There's flexible, and maybe it's not just how, hotel rooms. I don't know. I didn't go through the application again. but. I think there are COVID priorities that are COVID related issues that could affect these numbers. Oh, big time. And, and, I, and I, I, I can't imagine that the county commission would say no. I just can't imagine that they'd say no. Commissioner. Well, we do have a, we do have a, a safety piece also. Remember all of the events are, 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 right. are being submitted to their cities and stuff, but also coming to the county to to provide us another level of, of buffer for you guys um, or whatever. Mayor Kreisman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And that's kind of what I was going to follow up on is, you know, there's the large scale uh, event order that the county had, had entered. Uh, and a lot of our cities also um, mirrored it or made some minor modifications. <clears throat> but the result of that order, which I, I totally support and I'm very thankful uh, for the actions of the county on that, are that for people who want to put these events on, and, and we've got one coming up this weekend, Local Topia is an example, the cost to put that event on is going to be significantly more because for that event, for example, where people were coming in from all different directions, there was no gates, there was nothing, they have to put up fencing around the entire area in order to create limited ingress and egress. And so that's a significant expense that they're going to incur to put that event on. And so I think it's really important that we, we remember that too, is that there's, it's gonna cost more to put these events on to keep them safe, um, but how important it is that these events continue for our entire uh, county. And for the spread out, they're gonna have less people. Yeah. Right. And, 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 we, and we are trying to ensure that there is some continuity during these tough times, so when it, we get through it all, that they're still here and the efforts will still be there. I mean, it's such a big deal in our county, these special events, that we hate to lose them during this, during this period. Um, any, any other questions, comments, direction? Thank you. Appreciate it, Tim. Thank you. See you next month on that. You got it. Okay. All right. Excuse me. So I, go ahead. Where do we end up with that? <laughs> See you next month. Are we going to have a we're gonna committee? Be this we'll be voting on on the guidelines to, to get them out, right? I mean, that's so we'll come back with a report that looks at what's been done in the past. We'll add in what well, if we've have. Well, I know destination analyst has gone through and done event surveys. So we have information related to that. And this goes back to, I believe, 2019 
and then what we've seen in 2020. We'll go back, look at what's been funded, the up to amount, what was actually provided, uh, you know, the ROI that goes back and then look at that. And then I'll suggest that we'll also come back and say, hey, if we had to make some, if there's minor tweaks, what are those? If there's major tweaks, is that something we do now or is that something we put on that list to do the next year so we at least get it on, on the table? Does that, does that, does that work, Phil? Okay, so then whatever we, so we're gonna make some adjustments or a vote on some adjustments next month based on what your recommendations are after reviewing all the data? Yeah. And then we'll make those and then that has to go to the VCC at their next meeting? Then we would, we would move through that process. We'll have to look at those specific adjustments and see if they require BCC. Yeah, that's probably, what I was exactly. going to say. Yeah. 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 Some of these they probably will, but it depends. Yeah. Right. Some of the adjustments may not require that extra step. Okay. Some, some may. So we'll take a look at it, and then that may also skew what we end up doing here. We may right. choose, let's just hold off and making any change, those changes. If it has to go there, we think timeliness is more important than that change doing it this year, I mean. Gotcha. So I think that's something we'll just have to talk about next month. Yeah. And okay. I think more importantly is to look at it and say what we've done, what we what they got, and then what were the results, and, mm -hmm. and provide that feedback as well to this yeah. body. I, I, you know, being here for a number of years, uh, the old new product development and so forth, we had, you know, a lot of small things coming through that weren't very valuable. But I think that there's probably a few more uh, events out there that we could assist that are worthy of it that don't meet these. And so I think, uh, and, and especially since we haven't ever spent the budget that we put toward it, that we could loosen it up a little bit to attract some more. And in these times, we need as many things going on as possible, of course. So that's great. Yeah, I think that's something we'll look at and consider and then see if we have to take it to the BOCC. Hopefully we can do that. If we have to do that, we can do it rather quickly. Yeah. yeah. We'll just look at the timing and the dates and yeah. when everything yeah. has to be turned in. So but we'll, we'll, we'll pull that busy together. Busy part of next month's yeah. meeting. Yeah, okay. exactly. Okay, anything um, else under, de any, under, under no. department updates? Um, and then under my comments, just real quickly, under TDC bylaws, um, this is more of an FYI, and I'll let Michael explain from there. No, nothing we need to do today, but more of setting up for next month's meeting. As to the TDC bylaws, yeah. Steve, yeah, just real quick. Uh, those of you that uh, have been on the council will remember a few years back, we developed and uh, this board reviewed and made recommendations as to a series of bylaws that would control and up op the operation of the TDC. And somehow or another, it appears that um, in looking at my review, I couldn't find that the board actually, BCC had actually approved these. It may have been a miscellaneous item, but somehow I couldn't find the records of it. So just to confirm that, I spoke to Commissioner Eggers and to err on the side of caution, we're going to go ahead and have take them back to the BCC. I also recognize um, in my review of them saw that there were two kind of clerical things that I'm mm -hmm. going to clean up. Um, one being the, um, um, the discussion was under the statute, the BCC appoints the chair of the TDC, but the consensus was the, si the statute silent as to the vice chair. The consensus was that the TDC would then turn around and select the vice chair uh, themselves. So that's an inconsistency. Yeah, they're inconsistent yes. in the same way. There were one, competing one, versions. Yeah, that's one why. says BOCC yep, does yep. it, and the other one says it. So I'll clear that up. And then the other thing, real quick, uh, Commissioner, if I might, is there's been some confusion in the past as to how we've done it. Practically speaking, when someone has, for example, uh, Mayor Hibbert, who's not here, he filled in for Mayor Credicos, and there was still some time left on that term. And in the past, traditionally, not that this was required to be done that way, but how it's been done is if someone was appointed and there were six months left in the term, they only served the rest of those six months, and then they had to start a whole new term. So one thing we can clarify, which I think is where the board was headed last time, is that it's a four-year term from the point of a, uh, appointment, regardless of if it's you're filling in a vacancy or if you're starting the natural expiration of a term. So if that's the will of this well, board. We'll just talk about that. I, I, okay. Yeah, I don't, I'm sorry? I just want to make sure that whoever gets on here gets a full. That, and that's, that's what we terms. want to ensure. Yeah. Well, yes. So. And, then, and then the other thing was I just, I don't, I don't know, I don't see the roster of when these are up. I'd hate to be losing more than so many people in any one given year. So um, I want to make sure we look at, look at a, maybe look at a provision that allows an extra year, just 
it, it would be horrible to lose. And I, again, I don't know the roster, so okay. I mean, maybe that'll help answer some of my my concerns about turnover too much in one year. So if we can see the rosters and when their dates are, that would be helpful. What their current dates are, and then if, what what term they're on. That would be that would be helpful. And the other thing is any comp, anything in here that says shall. Mm -hmm always makes me nervous. Like, the TDC appointee shall uh, be within 15 days. Or each new TDC appointee shall meet with the staff to do something. So maybe it's to the best of their abilities within 15 days. You know, so just, you don't want them to create rules that we're not going to follow. Or if we are, if we are going to follow them, then we don't want to get too much trouble. So let's just clean some of those definitive stuff out of here. Or at least make those change recommendations, perhaps. Um, I, I don't really have anything else at this point. But no, when, that's it. When, when do you plan on? Bringing I can get them for the next meeting if you want to distribute them here, and okay. then we'll take them to the BCC. Okay, and then we'll just okay. Um, all right. Anything else? Just the the last item. Uh, I'm sure everyone's aware. March second starts the next legislative session. Uh, right now, there are three bills that at least I'm, I'm looking at, and I just more as an FYI, one is the fiscal 22 budget, uh, Visit Florida, which is one that we follow uh, every, each and every year, is uh, right now in the governor's budget for $50 million, which is the dollar amount they had for this year. So again, being supportive of that effort. Uh, there are two bills out there. The first one uh, relates to Visit Florida, and it uh, removes the sunset date uh, completely uh, from their, uh, the, the statute that would govern them. And it also would allow them to forward dollars that they don't use to the next budget year. Um, that is, uh, um, you know, there's, there's a Senate bill and a, and a House bill. The Senate bill is, is, is already moving on, moving through committees. The House bill is yet to be assigned. And then the last one uh, in following uh, relates to vacation rentals. Right now there is a Senate bill and a House bill. The Senate bill has already uh, moved through committee. House bill has not been assigned. Um, and, and again, I provided backup on what we hear from our statewide organization and what's going on. Um, and that was included in your backup. We can continue to provide that information. But if there are other areas of interest that we should at least pay attention to, I know uh, the, uh, the um, county administration has a gentleman, Brian Lowack, that follows that closely. Um, so we just want to make sure we keep those things on our radar once session starts because there is no tourism day this year like there has been in the past. It's all just because of the pandemic, a lot of those things aren't happening. So I, I just wanted to make sure you're aware of those things. Um, and, and again, any direction or feedback from the group as a whole, I'll be glad to take and keep, monitor and also let uh, Brian know as well. Russ, did you? Um, Steve, maybe uh, like last year, we could ask uh, if his schedule is uh, there to Brian to come and give us an update uh, during the session um, so that he relates back to us and we do to him. It's, uh, I thought it was very good last time. Probably the next two meetings would be helpful. Yep. So we'll do. We're halfway through the first meeting and then the work really starts to happen in, in April probably. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Any uh, any closing comments? Or, or, yes. Oh, uh, yes. Just I'm sorry, wanted, Doreen. Yes, if I could. Thank you. Uh, just wanted to acknowledge on the vacation rental bill, the legislative update. Um, it did apparently come out of the Senate panel yesterday, so they got a nod to move forward with that. Um, one of the concerns I have, and, and this information, Robin Miller from the Tampa Bay Beaches Chamber had to leave, and so she was conveying some info over to me, but. The, um, there is apparently um, one representative that wants to pull the grandfathering clause, which is extremely important that the cities, the municipalities, the communities continue that were in place as of um, 2011. I think it was uh, July of 2011, June 2011. As long as they had their rules and regulations in place, they've been grandfathered in and continue to operate. Um, that would be quite a disaster if that were removed. And so we, we want to 
continue. Um, I'm speaking for the industry as well, um, you know, that that needs to stay in place. But the chamber is monitoring that on a, a very close basis um, and keeping uh, everyone updated, so. Okay, thank you, Dory. Anything else? I just want to say as a final comment to say kudos out to Visit Florida for a great huddle 2021. They had to do it virtually and it was a for attractions anyways, it was a great success. I thought they had a did a fantastic job. We had over 60 appointments in three days. So they really did a great job. That's so good. That's great. Thanks, Tricia. Anything else? Anything else, Steve? Okay, we're adjourned. Thank you.